uh, Mike Bart was just elected as chair for the ensuing year, and Danny Kelman was just elected as vice chair. And now we're in the process of nominating the secretary of the board. My apologies. I'll nominate Mr. Johnson. I'll second that. Who seconded that? Chris. Are there any other nominations for secretary? Hearing none. Uh, Alyssa Johnson will serve as secretary of the board for the ensuing year. Vote. Ah. <laughs> 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 I'm in favor of Alyssa Johnson acting as secretary for the ensuing year. Please say aye. 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 Those opposed? <laughs> Hearing none, congratulations, Alyssa. And I would gladly hand over the meeting to Mike now. <laughs> thank, you, thank you much, Carla. Um, we'll now move into uh, conflict of interest policies and then rules of procedure. Uh, you want me to? I could explain. Conflict of interest, we do have a official conflict of interest uh, procedure. If, if any of you have not taken a look at I would take a look at it. Uh, basically, a conflict is that you should basically recuse yourself from any decision or act of this body if you have any, any appearance, whether they be actual or even if it's there's an appearance that you should uh, recuse yourself doesn't happen much i know we did have when mark was chair or you know again someone with a business we might have to have someone but those are typical scenarios where you would have where your business has some input directly on some sort of thing that we're voting on but that in a nutshell is what the, the conflict of interest uh you know, you have to declare that, you know, you should, you will abstain from voting and hopefully thereafter we would have a quorum to be able to vote. That's in a nutshell. Any questions? I have a question on five in that regard, which has disclosure basically. You think you have a conflict, you should say it, even if you think you can do it despite it, but then do you vote on that to move forward or does that mean another person? And it just was like a bit of a hanging clause. In general, it just said, like, if there's a conflict, use yourself to right, do it. But this one is worded able to act objectively in spite of potential conflict. Does that mean you still would be able to? If, but does the board vote on that generally? Yeah, the, the board should vote on it. Um, I think it is asking for transparency sure. and asking for kind of bending over backwards to make sure people understand what your interests are. And it's perfectly appropriate to say, I believe in spite of this, I can act accordingly uh, with the best interests of the town in mind. But if there's some debate or issue, then the board could, could ask you to reconsider and, and uh, accuse yourself on your own. Um, it's a little dicier if the board has to vote to say that you don't, that you have a conflict, because that's something that. It's supposed to be self policing and my expectation is probably won't have to dust that off again after tonight for a while. Thank you. Any other questions on the conflict of interest policy? I don't think we don't have to have a motion to. Just yeah, you need to approve, approve it. it. You need to approve it. It okay. has to be approved every year. Yeah. Approved every year. So, uh, would someone like to make that motion? I'll move to the uh, conflict of interest policy. Thank you. Uh, do we have a second? Sure. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the motion? Does this apply to other boards besides the sector? This title is not applied, right? It's the select board's conflict of interest policy. Um, I haven't, I didn't read it today. I, we had a long discussion about this last year it was rewritten a year ago um 
I think all the boards and commissions should adopt it and should model it after that, but the select board is really making it for itself. Yeah, and I would just say for discussion as someone who's on the planning commission, we never talked about or adopted it, so we were expected to follow it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think folks did in good faith. Yeah, I think several commissions do have that. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's and it's good, good to you know have someone know that because in any commission you can have some impact where you, you have a clear conflict that you should just refuse yourself. It's not a hard process. Okay. Any further, further discussion? If not, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Rules of procedure. Uh, just in general, we this is board follows uh, Robert's rules of order, kind of like what we're doing now. Uh, we are, all, all meetings are warned. Uh, we have, you know, we could go based upon that parliamentary procedure and that keeps everything in order. Uh, what also is really kind of in, in, important is that one, it keeps us on track, but the second thing that I think is even more important is that uh, as being, are we considered consider a deliberative body? When, in certain instances, right. In certain instances, we are. I think that's that's really important as as a deliberative body uh, that you do have those procedures. Has anyone has everyone reviewed those policies and procedures? Does anyone have a question on them? I have a question: Are they Robert's rules of order, or is it rules of procedure that have been adopted by the uh, Montreal of cities and towns? It's it's Robert's Robert's rules. Is Robert's rules okay? Robert's rules of order specifically for small meetings. Right. It's a few. Yeah. There's a delineation in Robert's rules. So technically, in a in a small meeting such as this, um, it's customary that the chair usually doesn't make a motion. It's it's okay for the chair okay. to make a motion. It's okay for the chair to second it because uh, sometimes there's issues with quorums so, and and you might not get something on the table. So it is Robert's Rules of Order, but there's a specific reference to uh, small bodies. And that's an important thing. Like for instance, whoever makes a motion, whoever makes a second may not necessarily even agree with the motion, but it's to get into discussion. Right. So that's fine. Any other questions? It's rather, in every select board that I've worked with, in both towns that I've worked in, it's it's always been adopted and it's always been used, except a little bit in backwards order. Robert's rules typically says that you make a motion to put it on the table. There's a second, and then you discuss it. Right. Typically, what happens here is the chair reads the issue. There's a long discussion about what's happening and what the Concerns are at the end. So the motion to to to, uh, to the motions to, made out. Yeah, and and it it really you know the proper procedure is for somebody to make a motion to get it on the table for discussion, and then you discuss and then you vote. But pretty typically here, there's a presentation made either by staff or perhaps by a select board member, and there's questions asked, and then towards the end there's a motion made and, and it's acted upon. So um, I think that, uh, you know, Robert helps to guide the chair, especially if there's a large meeting with public event in, involved um, and uh, clearly, you know, seconds and I mean, motions and seconds are required, but we're not sitting around with the rule book saying, oh, you didn't do this right, you didn't do that right. So. But in larger meetings, we might have someone might have a point of order or, or you know other things that are in proper tool. Right. So it is good to be so, you know, fairly familiar with the rabbit tool. Any other questions? So with that example, I'll move to accept uh, the mm -hmm. rules of order. Thank you. There a second. I'll second. Any further discussion? If not, oh uh 
All in favor to approve the rules of procedure, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, so the uh, motion passes. We will move on to the consent agenda items. For the for Roger and Alyssa, if you're not familiar with the consent agenda, <clears throat> the consent agenda is typically uh, uh, considered as one motion. So somebody would make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, and if there's a second, uh, any member can choose without a vote to take something off the consent agenda. Typically, the consent agenda means there's not going to be this. You accept the slate and you simply vote on it. Uh, if someone says, I'd like a discussion about letter C, the newspaper of record, uh, it doesn't have to be voted upon to take it off the consent agenda. It just, as one of the members has raised the question of it. So um, don't be intimidated by the consent agenda if, uh, in tonight's meeting or any meeting subsequent. Uh, if there's something on there that you feel that you'd like to discuss, just simply tell the chair, I'd like to talk about this issue. It comes off the consent agenda and the chair will put it where it belongs on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers your question. Hey, we have a motion. Okay. We don't have we don't a motion. Lead. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda item? So moved. I'll second. Thank you. We have a motion now. And any further discussion on the consent agenda? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. Just before I know we have now come to the public, I just want to say, make a brief statement. One, appreciate all the select board members on your um, guidance of me uh, as being the chair. I just want to say that the chair runs the meeting. We're all, eat. this is for the public. And I, I kind of don't like, I wish we had a better setup than this that we could kind of you know, face the public a little bit more. But all of us have equal votes in this. The chair just runs the meeting. And uh, make you know make sure things you know run right. Uh, long term, I know for the few people we might even say who runs the meeting. I don't think any, any one of us need more power. The thing that I do Back before, uh, if if you have something, especially that's why I said before the public thing. If anyone can limit their time to two minutes or under, if you have something further to say, we I would encourage you to get on the on the agenda to discuss an item more more fully. I also want to hope that as is the that we go into an era that I'm hoping we're seeing some more civility, the role of this body is primarily to run the business of the town. And I think that's what we want to stick mostly to. Uh, you know, there are, ev everyone has issues that they, they advocate for. I would encourage them to advocate them in the strongest way, but this body really has to run the, the town. And sometimes we have gotten a little bogged down as to what things. So that's my little speech for, for, for today. So now I, this is the part of the meeting where we give the public a chance to make any, any comments they wish to address the select board. Does anyone- That's either, not on the agenda. Right, that's not on the agenda. And does anyone have anything that they wish to uh, breach that's not on the agenda that they would, would approach either in the, the building or on uh, Zoom line? Yeah. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, the newly elected and the incumbents for uh, stepping forward to take care of uh, town board Gary. It is public service that you're doing, so thank you so much for stepping up. Thank you so much, Linda. 
So go ahead. Chris, go ahead. No, I was just making sure that the public didn't have anything to make yeah. a comment on, and then I was gonna proceed with something. Okay. Any anything further that anyone has to say? I'll just second what Linda said. I just want to thank Roger and Lisa for stepping up and other people are serving. Uh, this is a volunteer position. This is a really appreciate the follow that you do and the hour that you do to serve. And so thanks again for stepping up and looking forward to continue to work with you. Thanks for it. Chris, you have to just. Okay, I'd like to just take a brief minute um, talk about specific individual in this room. Uh, wasn't at the at the uh, informational meeting. Um, kind of a little bit unprepared for this because <laughs> it was a last minute thing. But uh, Mr. Flanders, I wanted to uh, express uh, the gratitude and appreciation of this entire town for your many years of dedication mm -hmm. on the board and in the community as a whole. Um, your institutional knowledge and your history background is, uh, you know, is uh, difficult to match. Um, I think from a memory standpoint, you probably learned, remember more about what went on in this town during your years here than uh, perhaps even my uncle Sid Thurston, and he could remember <laughs> everything. <laughs> I swear to God. Um, and quite honestly, I. I notice a lot of things in town. And one thing that I've noticed from time to time when I'm coming through the village is you out taking your stroll uh, with the, at one point your dog uh, in the past, but uh, the pleasure and the pride that I see on your face uh, as you enjoy your stroll through town uh, is in itself, uh, you know, uh, appreciated uh, because I know that that you feel good about the community you live in and uh, uh, I hope to think that uh, everything you've accomplished over the years uh, fits good in your heart you know um, there's been ups and downs I'm sure as there is with any elected officials but uh, I just want to extend a, a, a Gratitude and thanks from this entire community for, for all the years uh, that you put into this community. And uh, mm -hmm. I did uh, manage to get up and get uh, your, your award that you have given for so many years to other people. And now it's uh, finally come back to, to represent probably the person that deserved it the most. So here you are. Uh, congratulations for your key work. Uh, Want to drag Bill in here too? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he got his award yeah. there at the last meeting. Oh, there you go. Oh, thanks, guys. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well, thank you, Chris. <laughs> thank you, everybody. You uh, you managed to do something I I. Uh, tried to do many times to surprise people. <laughs> so I didn't have any inkling where you were headed. <laughs> I know we last year because of COVID, we didn't do it. And right. um, things kind of snuck us up on us this year and yeah. um, didn't get to do it. So uh, yes, I do. Uh, Everything you said is uh, accurate there, and uh, but it's not me. It's everybody in Waterbury that works together to do it. And you know, um, the, you probably heard Bill's uh, story. My first meeting as a water commissioner was Bill's first meeting as Waterbury's town manager and village manager. So 
it's been what 80 uh, 34 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 80 First thing, yeah, so March. It was probably today. <laughs> I started on uh, March fifteenth, and then the next meeting. So it's right around now. Yeah, three, four years ago. Barely so. had electricity back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, because of the COVID, I was a little fearful that with Bill's uh, deciding to retire and and you, you know, as a board member of EFUD. Uh, with the possible potential of EFUD, you know, coming together with the rest of the town, whether or not you were still going to be part of, you know, the board and whatnot, I figured that uh, I didn't want to miss the opportunity, uh, let it slip by that uh, you two would probably deserve the Keith Wallace Award as, as much as anybody not receive one, you know. So. And I, uh, you went through, uh, Probably Carl and you where we got it from the bills of yeah. all the years and yeah. uh, things that I was down at Costco's yesterday and I still haven't got the plaque um, from Everett's name um, engraved there. We always take it back afterwards. And I pretty near stopped in the other day <laughs> to, to get that plaque engraved. And uh, well, you another one you can take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you to everyone and uh I appreciate it and it's an honor. You're very welcome. Thank well, you. Sir. Congratulations. Okay. Just, just a note. I just noticed no TV today. No. No. Right. We have it recorded. I know that, but we usually have the Orca media people here. I'm just when you just notice that. Okay. We'll move on to the next part of our meeting. It's a joint meeting with the E5 commissioners. We don't have a quorum at the moment, but we're a little early. <laughs> Do you want to a little bit? Um, it's scheduled for 7:40. Bob Fanuki is here, skips here, but you know there's three other commissioners, and I don't know if they're planning to tune in at 7:40 or not. If you want, we can. Do you want to do the next? Go to the next. Week? We'll do the 8:30 item and then come back to yeah, this can. to see if any other commissioners come. Yeah, that, that's fine. Does, they, does anyone in the meeting have any objection to us moving to the discussion of the inclusion? If not, we will move in that direction. And just, I know, I know we've, we've all had some discussion as to why the inclusion banner was removed. It was more of a procedural matter uh, because the existing, so, so the previous select board had it that it would be decided at the, uh, when the new select board was chosen, that it would be decided as to whether the banner will be continued. Uh, and that's the only reason it's not saying that we want to take it down. That. There's a little background noise if someone could mute, mute themselves. Uh, so just to, clear, just to be clear, Mike, uh, the motion that was made stated that the banner would be flown from December until town meeting day. And I had it taken down town meeting day because that's what the motion was. So I, I just want to make sure there was a direction there by Yes, the select board to take it down in order to allow the new select board to discuss the issue. Right. So that's where we are today uh, to discuss uh, should we put the banner up? Uh, and I'll, I'll first, you know, I should put it out first to the select board and then we'll hear comments from the audience. And maybe if I could hear from each one of you your, your, your opinions of brief slide. Uh, my question is procedural, and I'm, I don't know if Bill is the person who has a more solid answer, so I might wait on that <laughs> one. <laughs> but I, um, I mean, I, you know, made the motion to put it up. I'm fully in support of having it. I don't think it ever needs to come down. I'm in support of leaving it indefinitely. I don't imagine any reason it shouldn't be up there. 
Um, my question is though, what route we take to not have this conversation annually and whether that's making a, a vote to leave it indefinitely as a board or if it's better to put as a ballot item to the town, which is something I'm gonna take personal responsibility for because I asked that last year and then forgot to follow through with it. So I take responsibility for, for getting to see about getting that on the ballot. So um, I guess I see those as the two routes and then you know the intermediate decision would be to leave it up till town meeting day, but actually put it on the ballot this time, which we sort of dropped the ball on last time. I don't see um, why we couldn't have it. It's kind of like where a lot of motions are until, you know, indefinite until, you know, withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And I don't see why we can't do that. I think it's just the way, as Bill said, right. the way the motion. Yeah, and it's that's on me because I made that motion right. with that wording, but then forgot about and it. And I don't think, you know, yeah. I know I've spoke to several individuals. I don't think it was any intent to take down the banner. You know, I'm fully in favor of the banner, you know, because it stands for what this town's about. Any other opinions? Lisa, Roger, Chris? In lieu of what's happening in Ukraine, I think it's even more important. Echo Danny's sentiments. I think it's important and I support coming here. So are we <clears throat> not entertaining the ballot issue or are we? <clears throat> well, we could we could discuss that. I think mm -hmm. I want to hear first from the select board, and then I want to open it up to public comment. You know, if people if they have comments. Uh, I feel like uh, you know, the, this town sent uh, two hundred and fifty uh, soldiers during the Civil War to end slavery. Uh, I think it's entirely appropriate that we. Uh, Thank you. Does anyone in the public, whether on Zoom land or in the audience, have anything, any comments? Or you want to step forward? Um, I just want to thank all of you for that um, adopting and now we're adopting the uh, putting back the banner up. I think I've shared with a couple of you about um, some of the new residents that have moved into our town recently who have moved, uh, reached out to me to talk about um, some of the reasons why they chose to move to Rutherford. And part of that includes the research that they did on the town and knowing the work that we have done collectively, select board and work to make this community more inclusive to the banner was part of that message. And so I just want to share that with you all uh, because what we're doing here um, isn't making a difference. It's attracting new people. Um, and it's, I hope that we will continue to do that because our town is moving in a direction that people really want to move here. And so I just want to thank you and share some of those stories with you. So, thank you. Very much. Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone else? Hi. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. Yes, I do. Uh, Mallory Culbertson, Waterbury resident. Um, I just wanted to voice my support for the banner. Um, it feels very timely. Um, and I'll just share kind of a scary incident from today. I was walking to the post office and there were two stickers on a pole by the roundabout uh, from white nationalist organizations. Uh, and there were uh, neo-Nazi symbols on this uh, sticker that was in town in front of the uh, gas station. Uh, so uh, as much as you know, I think a lot of us wish that it wasn't such uh, a pressing issue these days, there's very much um, still people out there with very uh, violent, racist attitudes, um, and they are promoting in our town. Uh, so I think it's really important for the board to take a very firm uh, stance against racism, and, and that banner I think is a very key part of that. Uh, just one voice my support there. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> is that just thumbs up or? <laughs> okay. Awesome. Come on up. 
Um, I'm not opposed to. You could just state your name for the record. Sure, Elizabeth Walton or Lisa. Thank um, I'm not opposed to the banner itself because I think that it was a positive compromise that the town made to uh, accommodate uh, multiple people. My only concern is that we're setting precedents for because my well, my understanding is the policy is that the, that the polls were donated for us to make announcements, events. I mean, like what we have up there now. And I understand that an exception was made to the rule and I, I don't have a problem with that. The concern I have is, are we gonna to continue to have these types of requests made by individuals in the community for similar such banners that aren't announcements? And what is the board gonna do about that? And how much time is gonna be dedicated to those <laughs> issues versus the, the matters that many of us consider to be more pressing? I think it's very clear and that came out in the discussion that those banner polls are basically to announce events. And we did take a very unique stance for this one issue. And I think it is unique and I think it's a singular. Uh, again, it's probably going to stay there probably forever. And because I think it's it's making a statement about what the people of Waterbury feel. And I, I don't think anyone in this room could say that doesn't it's not what Waterbury feels. We made a declaration of inclusion. I think it represents that. Uh, but again, for every, you know, stop this, you know, as much as like the Ukrainian war, you know, you know, we all have our fit opinions about all kinds of different things. I don't think that's the um, as a matter of fact, I'm a Rotarian. And even the Rotarians made that point because that's why they provided the money to put up that that poll to announce events. And I think that's what's going to stay up. So I hope and I, and I think Danny's idea of putting that on the ballot is a great idea so that the, the town has a say in the matter. It would be a uh article, so it'd be a floor discussion. That's okay. listing on the ballot. Thanks. Right. If we ever have a traditional town meeting <laughs> we will. next um, year. We right. will. Right. Well. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> any any other comments? <clears throat> So Mike Bill keeps jumping in and out. There he is. <laughs> yep. uh, as a Rotarian, do you recall what policy the banners had? And can you refresh everybody's memory on what that was? Yeah. And did we make an official change to it to allow for this exception? We just we did. The official yeah. policy is just for to announce. Events so, and yeah, it would be up for two weeks, and you know, after the up to the event, and then be taken down. So, so is there room for what four banners? That's what, okay. Mark has his hand up. Mark Fryer. Mark Fryer. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mark. Hi, thank you. Um, I think one of the this came out of the last discussion last year, but I think the important narrative to get away from is that. These polls are property of the town. The, the the banner being put up is not, you know, I think the policy is really for people that want to advertise events, but you could put a banner on the building, you could put a banner wherever, the select board makes a decision. I, I don't think this specific banner falls under the rule book of, you know, the polls. I really think the important thing here is that the select board supports it votes it forward and then you know it can stay on those polls i think trying to say that this is somehow skirting a, a policy that policies for you know people in the town or other people that want to announce events but it's property of the town and the, and the select board to make a decision on what to put on those polls completely separate from the policy so i think that's the important thing that came out of the discussion last year and i think we need to get away from the discussion like this is somehow skirting some kind of policy because it's it's town business and the town is deciding to put this banner up, not an individual or a group. Thank you, Mark, for that input. Bill. Yeah, so um, what Mark said is true. The, the banner policy was adopted by the select board. It is the select board's policy as the governing board of the town. The select board has the authority and ability 
to change its own policy. If the policy had been voted for at town meeting, uh, it would be the policy of the town meeting of the town, and therefore only the town meeting could change it. Uh, so it is within the select board's purview to uh, decide what the policy is. And as Mark suggested, there was some conversation. I'll just remind everyone that I did seek at the board's request some legal opinions about whether this could be placed up there uh, and would that have a, an impact about what other banners might put up. And the, the legal opinion that was provided the town was that this is the select board in their capacity as the governing board of the town deciding what's going on the town's manifold. So this is not Black Lives Matter. It's not the Rotary Club. It's not uh, you know the Booster Club from Harvard Union. This is the town of Waterbury saying this. So you have the right to to, to put it up if you want. Uh, and you don't have to put up something that another organization wants you to put up unless you believe that that speech is what you want to represent as you know the town's policy. So you have the perfect right to put this up. Um, you know, and just to make a personal observation, if you might allow me, Mike. Yep. I'm not um, not trying to step in it or cloud the issue, but. <laughs> I always wonder, and I, I felt the same way about <clears throat> all the American flags that Tony de Blasi used to hang up along uh, on all the on all the power poles. And I'm a very patriotic uh, American and I like the American flag, but <clears throat> I would have people ask me, they'd come to town and say, why are the flags? I said, well, we always have them up. And it's like, at some point, when does the symbol fade into the background and it's not even seen anymore? Mm -hmm. So um, if the board wants to put it up and put it up forever, that's a fine thing to do. Uh, but it's, uh, and I support the, what the statement is, but I just ask you and others, does it, fade into the background and lose its significance if it's up constantly. I'm not suggesting it should be up again and it can you know, go up for a while, come down. But if you're just gonna paste it up there, um, at what point does it become not uh, effective? White noise. Yeah, it becomes white noise. And it's just a question. I'm not saying that you have to not put it up. That's not what I'm saying. It's just a question. Mm -hmm. Any further comments or Maroni? We've got people in the audience. <laughs> Please state your name. My name is Jamie McGibbon. I can spell it for you if you would like me to. For official notes. As long as you wrote it down. I did. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a resident of the town of Waterbury. Um, I think uh, in regards to your comment about it being the background, um, as a person of color, I think it really means a lot to me. It's something I notice, especially. Um, you know, with the rise of anti-Asian hate, it's been something that I fear every time I go outside is if I'm gonna get harassed, um, I don't wanna be harassed by my own town. And so I think it really speaks a lot to me um, for just being included in this town and being seen. And I think it also, to what Maroni had mentioned for visitors coming into town, it's not fading into the background for them, but it speaks to how we are inclusive of other people and diversity and background. So it might fade, the background for some folks who are in town, but I think in terms of visitors, for other people of color, other people from diverse backgrounds, it's something that I will always look for as, as being something that this is my town and I can do. Um, yeah, and so, <clears throat> yeah, so I would just like to speak. I think, um, I think it means a lot, especially to people who in town as well. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I it's. Thank you, Bill, for bringing that up. Uh, I, I was actually thinking about that, and I was more in favor of having it up there, you know, to the Civil Bureau of Time and taking it down and putting it back again. And I got to think about it, and that would just be symbolic of certain events, right? Um, we want it to be up there. 
So if the select board is sad, we should vote for it to be up there. Whether the message gets lost eventually, but I think, yeah, it might for those of us who live here and see it every day, but the people who come here, um, that's a good thing. Um, so putting in like a certain event will be like, oh, you are just doing this, like, oh, for example, on February, uh, Black History Month, let's put it up there. Well, I don't think Black History just should be celebrated just in one month. So I think having it out there, if the select board decide to do that, um, that would be more reflective of what I think our community wants to see. So that's just my, my take. Yeah. Thank you. Also, did you have something to add? No, I would defer to what we said about just echoing that. Uh, well, if anything, I think we heard very compelling testimony from folks here tonight as why it's important right now. And I guess I appreciate your comment earlier that we have to at some point figure out what's that oscillation between not discussing it every month. So I personally feel it's important to get it up now. And I think um, we also have the power of our board as community members um, to figure out when if we need to bring up another discussion, but I guess to me that brings back to that conversation of what's the time, but my personal view is let's get it up and let's get it up now. I agree with that statement. I hear what Bill says about how things in the background do become white noise. You don't notice them, but I'd rather keep it up until we feel it's it's not effective, you know, and I don't know if, if that day is gonna come. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if we have the option to say, Maybe in five years we want to do something else. And maybe that's, you know, it's just, you know, this board would then have the option to do something else. You know, but I think I don't want to necessarily go through this process every year just to, you know, do something that to me is just so ingrained that we need to have a discussion every year. I would rather spend 15 minutes on discussing. Black history, or you know, or, you know, different, you know, Asian racism, or something else. You know, I think you know, having a, a, a side meeting on something like that would be much more appropriate. I think, than, you know, just saying, should we take the banner up or down? Personal thing. So could we move, move to, to, the the to better put up until the select board votes to bring it down? Is there a second to that motion? Oh, yeah. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion on the motion? If not, the motion is to put the banner back up until the select board uh, chooses to take it down. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for all your great comments. Okay, I think we can move back to uh, the joint meeting with the EFUD. I think we have a forum now. Yes, we rounded up the EFUD <laughs> commissioners. Uh, <laughs> two of them are on Zoom. Bob Finucan and Cindy Parks are uh, commissioners, and we have uh, Lefty Say and Natalie Howell um, here. Um, with that, I'll Sherman. Sherman. Pardon? No, Sherman. 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 <laughs> it's um, well, with a mask, I didn't recognize. <laughs> oh, Just in terms bad. of procedure, do you have to op open your <laughs> joint meeting with us? Or? Yeah, so I was about to do that. Okay, good. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I would call the meeting of the uh, Edward Ferrara Utility District um, for Monday, March 21st, a joint session with the uh, Waterbury Select Board. And we um, have an agenda. A, uh, there's a slight modification to the agenda. Um, if we were going to talk about the four properties we propose to transfer, and along with that, there's also transfer of the UDAG fund. So I'm going to give you, have Bill give you a brief summary of the UDAG funds at the same time under that. So um, are there any modifications to that? Agenda or other than that of the stuff? No, maybe someone from your board should make a motion to approve that. I'll make a motion. A second. I'll second it. You're just adding a discussion about the UDAC funds? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yeah. That agreeable to the yes, all in favor. So all, all just have a vote, all in favor, and then we're good to go. All in favor of the motion as uh, the agenda for the joint session as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. So who made the motion? Lefty. 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 Who seconded it? Nah. Nah, well, yeah. Okay. Um. So you're out of the lead on the yes, the municipal merger. I mean the manager search. Yep. We have had a number of discussions with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns about uh, engaging them to uh, do a, a search. Uh, we're looking at compared to the cost for outside headhunters, they're probably very reasonable. Plus they have a lot of expertise in municipal government. So, and the person that they're in their proposal that's gonna hire is an ex uh, municipal manager from the uh, town of Williston, uh, Rick, Rick McGuire. Uh, he was a town manager there for 30, probably 30 plus years. So he's for pretty long time. And he, he's somewhat like, like, like a bill. He's, he's very, I know a little bit of him, very capable. Uh, he was in Williston a little less than 20 years, I think. 20 he had years. been in Middlebury, then he went to okay. Connecticut. Then he, he didn't serve one. Kind well, of well, I know he's a longtime municipal manager, so he would have the expertise. And, you know, I think both both bodies would probably want to meet with, with them. We probably also need to decide if we, in addition to having um, select board members and EFUB members, do we want to have a like a general, you know, resident member on, on, on that search in some way, shape, or form. Uh, that's for all of us to, to discuss. But we probably want to move forward because uh, time will slip by very quickly. And there are other key municipal manager vacancies out there. So we're going to be competing against those different markets. So I think it's, to me, essential that the sooner the better that we start that process. And that's why we have, uh, we've had the EFA commissioners here to kind of hear what your concerns are and think if you think that's a good strategy engaging with the League of Cities and Towns. And so I'll leave it to any of the commissioners. Did you circulate the contract to them? I thought they got that at that last meeting. I don't know. I think when we when the me didn't you get at the meeting that we had? I I went to you guys. Didn't we have a copy of that? No, I don't believe so. I think it's a good idea. You know, we don't have a copy. Um, I'm like I'm like Roger Clemens. I misremember. I, I that comes with age. Yeah, I guess that's some uh, factor of age. I I thought that was circulated at that meeting. No, otherwise I would have gotten. So is my, I guess before I forget here, is there is there a uh, job description that if there's if there's possibilities of somebody that might be interested in a position outside of BLCT search, <laughs> is there a job description that we can get our hands on uh, that somebody could review to see if they were interested in? In the position that's part of it they'll develop uh one but they probably want our input to see what we want to have included in in that because so each... it, it says step one develop recruitment plan define job qualifications right. and requirements for the position before embarking on the process it's important to discuss the desired characteristics for the position and develop a plan on how the recruitment process will be undertaken and who will participate. So that's whether you have a search committee, you know, I mean, Watery is unique in some respects. There are other communities like ours, but, um, you know, I, I, there's, there's, uh, what, 
four or five elected boards in town. Uh, so there's the select the select board, the library commissioners, the cemetery. The cemetery commissioners, and the listers, which I don't do anything for the listers. But those other four boards, I, I go to all their meetings. Right. Um, and you know, most towns when they're going to hire a manager have a select board or a city council, and there's one entity. So you're going to have to figure out because both uh, I was hired by the village and the town. It was one person doing two jobs. It wasn't a vote of the committee. Each the select board had to vote. The village trustees had to vote. I'm sure they reached consensus, but. Uh, so the first thing that has to happen, and I would encourage it, as Mike said, sooner than later, but the next step after you talk about characteristics and the plan, a job description will need, need to be updated. When I came, nobody gave me a job description when I came here. I don't have a job description except for the general statutes of the state of Vermont, which is a pretty good job description of what the municipal managers responsibilities, roles, and authorities are. Um, Chief Executive and Financial Officer of the community uh, hires and supervises all yeah. the staff, um, purchasing agent, all that. So the, the, the specific duties uh, from the statute are very clear. Um, what other things I do here, that needs to be flushed out, but they'll do all of this and um, I recommended back in December that we contact the LCT. I think Mark Fryer did. Um, and there's a proposal that Mike had. Uh, I'm sorry that you don't have it. Right. Uh, I, I have specifically stated from the beginning that I don't want my fingerprints on this process and I don't want my fingerprints on the new person. I will certainly help the boards when it comes to uh, talking about what things I do. I'm happy to do that, but you know, here's, I, I kind of noticed nobody had one and I wondered if you all had it on your electronic devices, but um, the cost estimate is in the 6,500 to $12,750 range, depending on what services you, uh, you ask for. So I would recommend that quite soon you contact Abby Friedman at the LCT, who is with McGuire's supervisor, and tell her that you want to meet with Mary or she and Rick and get this process going. And to me, that would be the first step to just getting, you know, a couple of representatives from the select board, a couple of representatives from EFI. Then, if we want to determine we want to have a general rep representative, that's everyone's pleasure as to what. But I think the numbers, you know, we'll find out really with that first meeting with Vermont League of Cities and Towns a, a little more. And I do apologize. I thought that was sent at that at that meeting that we had that. Um, EFUD meeting. So for the first step, can you forward that to everyone on the EFUD and on the yeah. select board? And then can you, or would you like me to reach out to Abby and we can set up that initial meeting and see who would you like to? Happy to, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, and I'll ask him. Yeah. Okay. Do we need a motion? Probably it would be a good idea when you contact Abby to ask her to get some dates that right it's a, you know, dates. a number yeah. of dates so that you can then communicate it um, mm -hmm. out to the other board members and i do agree with what bill said in terms of i understand why bill does not want to be you know i don't think he's not concerned about the municipality but i think <laughs> you know it's it's just a good it's always you know when you've had a job for 34 years you kind of you know, have certain uh, certain ideas the way things are going to be done, and we all hope that they can live up to what Bill has done for this community. And you know, I think even Bill would say, hopefully, the person being even better. Maybe I'll be there for the next thirty-five years versus thirty-four years. But I think 
that's really the first step is is the meeting. Uh, um, so you, are you going to send out this? I can do that uh, as well. That's never, I have it, so I okay. can send it I, to. I just want to make sure that. Sure. I thought that went out to you it's know okay. all you the other fund commissioners. So you're going to contact Abby about this. Right. I'll get some dates and then I'll ask her how many representatives she thinks is best for that first meeting. And then I guess from there we can talk about forming that. Okay. Right. We want well, to two people from each board to be this initial meeting with Abby to kind of lay it out because if you have everybody. It's going to be a more mess. meeting and things. Right. EFA can have two people that's not a quorum so that we right. can meet. So I would suggest maybe we'll work on getting two people who will do this and you can. And then when we choose those two people, we can work with what's the agreeable debate to meet with Abby and uh, get the process started, bring that back to the, to the boards. Now, do we want to have, and I'll, I'm going to pose this as a question, do we want to have a resident? Member? Well, I think the core committee can, once you meet with okay, Abby, saying can the two decide, and, then, and then decide after. Make a recommendation back to the, that's after the board. So. I think that'll be a good question to ask them as well. So right. we'll come away with a little bit more knowledge. Well, I think in some of the materials, they say, you know, some do mm -hmm. eat either way. So I think it's kind of what... Yeah. <clears throat> And it seems like it would be a good idea to uh, contract with the BLCT if we think this is mm -hmm. the right way to go uh, so we don't lose a lot of time and uh, probably eager to, right. to have this made official. So maybe we need to right. be prepared to vote on that in the next meeting. Yeah, because we kind of didn't want to go ahead until we had, you know, this is our first meeting of, you know, this, so, this particular slide board. And I think it was a little, you know, even though we had the information at our last select board meeting, it probably was not appropriate to go so far. Well, I, I think you can actually, um, without too much difficulty, both boards individually could vote to uh, agree to move forward with BLCT, allowing the committee mm -hmm. members to work out the details of whether it's you know the sixty five hundred or the five thousand five hundred uh, uh, contract, that I've got there's money in both budgets to take care of all of this, and I think rather than have to come back to another meeting, if you agree to move forward with BLCT now, I don't think that's harmful, and then you can have that. Uh, Contract. So, is everyone agreeable? Yeah, thank I'll, you. For I'll that. move on behalf of the uh, select board to uh, allocate uh, our portion of those fees uh, to move forward with the contract with BLCT. Maybe, and to move forward with. And to move forward with the. To, uh, to uh, engage BLCT. Engage uh, E5 as well. Thank you. Second. Well, let's have a second first, then we can discuss. One second. Second. Okay. You just had a question. Yep. By contracting with DLCT, I guess I need to clarify that doesn't preclude other people from applying for this. Yeah, you know, DLCT, they're 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 not applying for the job. What you're right. doing with that or so is they're gonna help yeah. you put together a search um like document. This is what the town of Waterbury is looking for, and then they're gonna they're gonna market it. Basically, they're gonna uh, advertise, but it certainly does not preclude anybody on the select board from you know mailing their cousin mm -hmm. in Chicago mm -hmm. a notice that hey, this job is open. So yeah. it, it doesn't preclude anybody mm -hmm. from. I just wanted to make sure yeah. it wasn't exclusive yeah. contract. You know? yeah. No, no. Yeah, for the service, the facility. Right. The yeah. 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 We're looking because I think we discussed last time because I know I've been involved in some pretty high level searches. Dollar wise, this is pretty attractive. And plus, to me, the best thing is they know about municipal government. And I think, you know, where a lot of individual headhunters might not have that specialty as they do. So 
you know, that we're not getting something and just headhunters are going to be, a, I know, a lot more expensive. And, and also, Chris, just so you understand, VLCP isn't going to be recommending to the board, you know, who would select. Here's what the, they're going to, they're going to bring information, they'll market it, they'll generate interest, and then, you know, all the resumes will be made available to the, to the committee. Um, you know, they might talk to you about, hey, look, you know, if somebody with a high school diploma at, uh, applies, do you want to talk to them? You know, I think they, they will do screening if you ask them to. If the board says we want to see every resume that is uh, that comes in, that's up, that's up to the board to work out with, with them how much filtering you want them to do with it. David had a fee like do you want to do credit searches on the applicant? They'll they'll do that to ferret out, you know, someone who might have heard yeah. that. And, and on that, just as you want, so you all understand, we already do that when we hire people here. And the law in Vermont does not let you do a background investigation until you've actually offered the job and right. So you don't get to do background investigations right. on 15 people. You narrow the field, you decide that you're going to hire Joe Smith, and then you have Joe Smith signing up that says the job is subject to a successful completion of the background investigation, which includes all kinds of different things. So just so you understand, you don't get to yeah. check into everybody's history, only the person that- Thanks for the clarification. I mean, my only concern was making sure we get as broad of a suite as we can on this, you know, on this search. Uh, that we could direct yes. them to where we like what newspapers and things that you feel, the places that you feel to advertise. That's part of what the committee will be doing is recommending those kind of things. It, it, you know, we're there to guide them into helping them to do the search, but they're the professionals at first. You know why? I don't think we want to do this ourselves. <laughs> Thanks to you all last year and EFA for putting money in the budget. Um, <laughs> but that's not actually what's more. I just wanted to clarify. So I think I fully support the I think motion that's made to uh, Danny and Mike, and thank you for being willing to meet the meeting. And just wanted to clarify that we will come back to the full board to discuss the composition of the search committee more broadly, yes. just because I think that's oh. an important conversation. Mm -hmm. But thank you all for being part of the first meeting. So the motion is made and seconded. Yep, the motion is seconded. Mm -hmm. We're in discussion. Any further discussion? There's no further discussion. A motion to <coughs> approve um, moving forward with this with the search. Uh, everyone's everyone in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Being none, motion passes. So then uh, the commissioners would need to make a similar motion. Is that yes, I'll make a similar motion that we will um we approve to move forward with BLTC for the search and initiate the and make the initial meeting with two candidates that we will present when the time is made. Time is made. I'll second that. Second. I'll second it. Cindy? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, Motion has been made and seconded to uh, move forward with the select board with the BLTC as uh, discussed in searching for a new manager. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion uh, passes. So I want to move on to uh, transfer of EFUD properties to the town. Yes, um, got a handout here. Um, that we had put together. This is uh, four properties that EFUD, uh, that were properties of the village trustees in the village of Waterbury. And when we dissolved the village, we became EFUD. Um, these were properties that were used uh, for the 
the village purposes and things, and uh, we retain those as um, part of EFUD. And uh, I don't know, a couple, three months ago, or even longer than that, we talked about transferring these to the town that they were um, critical to the use of the or the operation of the water system or the sewer system and things. And we had met with the select board and put together an agreement. Um, on the handout on the back side lists these four properties. Um, we'll start with the smallest to the largest. One is the little welcome sign at the head of the roundabout that's on a small piece of village property and things. Um, the next one was the Elm Street parking lot um, that the village developed in uh, 99 and things, and we retained ownership. Uh, the Rusty Parker Park, um, up at the uh, railroad station that the village purchased in 1930 from the railroad and things. Um, and the last piece is the 40 acre site uh, that the ice center is on uh, River Road that the uh, village obtained uh, when the interstate went through, they swapped some village land that uh, the village owned under the interstate and uh, got that in uh, return. It was part of the state hospital uh, farm at the time. So those is all the trash that's buried there coming to this field, folks. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually uh, been very useful as uh, material storage uh, place for the highway department once it was filled in, and the <laughs> village. Um, forget what year, but we spent quite a bit of money with consultants to investigate the chemicals that are there and it's been cleared as uh, doesn't have to be monitored anymore and things. So um, I wouldn't recommend building over it because of the stuff that's buried there, but it's uh, safe for the material storage. So um, there's no more monitoring that's happening that uh, was closed out. And I want to say at least 15 years ago, anyway, wasn't it? Yeah, so the work work has been there. Yeah, yeah. there okay. were um, there were wells drilled. Remember who did the work? I can't remember who did the work. Oh, you need the monitor? Yeah. Um, Heindel and Heindel 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 Heindel. Heindel. Right. Okay. Um, And at the time, we put together an MOU that we had come to the select board. Mark was. Uh, chairman at the time and those on the select board had gone over the uh, things that we wanted to make sure one that you were willing as a select board to accept those properties before we went and voted to uh, turn them over to you. Um, Is the only change what's in red from yes. what we previously got? That's yes. Um, and what we were looking for at the time, merger wasn't um, high on everybody's list that wasn't talked about at that time. So we wanted in return for giving these to the town for a hundred dollar deal. Um, we wanted an agreement that uh, EFUD employees and things could have space in the municipal office without being charged rent that we paid for this building as town residents, all the uh, water and sewer customers in the town pay taxes. So that was the thinking at the time that if we had agreement that would, you know, 20 years down the road, we wouldn't be charged rent, that we were willing to transfer these, to put it up to a boat to be uh, transferred back. So we added in there in a little red in case um, merger doesn't happen, it still has to get voted in and things when uh, we get to do that, that, um, if, if uh, after it's voted in, the water and sewer departments would have their own revenues and things to maintain the things that they wouldn't be asked to pay rent out of that, that the same uh, thing that was in enforce when uh, the, we were EFUD would be the same as if we were merged back in. Um, so what I'd like to do is, uh, we haven't talked about this attention as a uh, EFUD commissioners either, we'll be meeting uh, 
April prior to our annual meeting. So I would just lift, leave this with you that you haven't seen it before. And uh, before our annual meeting in May to have, um, you had a chance to look at it and, and kind of agree with it so that by the time we have our annual meeting in May, we could report back that yes, the select board has agreed to take the properties and this is an agreeable MOU before um, the EFUD residents you know, vote on the motion. So, did you want to explain why you were bringing it back? And that, you know, there was talk a couple of months ago that since we were going to be talking about merger, that we didn't have to do this and go through this exercise, but why the EFUD commissioners maybe think that it's a good idea to do it now? Um, well, you graciously voted the $50,000 to study the planning of the thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, not critical to the operation of the water system and things. And, you know, while we talked about the merger going down the road and things, I, 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 it, it seems like a good idea to do this now. And, uh, you know, we're also going to talk about the UDAC money and things. Um, and that you were more, you thought, I think it was partly because of the manager search that you didn't think that doing, I know that's the next item on the agenda, but uh, it kind of tied together. I think. Um, yeah, I mean, it, we just thought it was more useful to do this at our annual meeting. It's coming up and all the e flood residents would go there. Uh, when so. I had <laughs> talked in December, when I mentioned that I was going to retire and then made the initial proposal about the money for uh, the $600,000 and exchanging it for the UDAG fund, I talked about that doing this might lead to a merger and then in January, we kind of talked a little bit about the fact that merger, you know, maybe maybe it could happen. There's a, an election in the fall, but um, my recollection, anyway, at the last EFI meeting was that the EFI commissioners talked a little bit and said, you know, finding a new municipal manager is the biggest priority. You know, nothing is really going to change right now as far as how we operate. The merger is a good goal, but probably we should concentrate on getting a manager first. And when they said that, I kind of said, well, yeah, maybe even the manager might want to have some input into what the new charter and stuff like that. So, That's my recollection as well. I just think, you know, as much as at first I, I thought moving this all forward would be a good thing, but the search to me is of tantamount importance. and. I think we can get through this. And again, maybe the new municipal manager may have some input in this area. If anything, but. Well, um, yeah. So the second part yep. of the added thing is uh, UDAG funds um, that I've asked Bill to put together a summary um, that the trustees managed until such time as the village was dissolved that became the uh, EFUD commissioners manage. Um, and it's, you know, money that was loaned to, uh, we were looking for businesses and things within the village um, to manage these funds. The bills put together a nice summary of, uh, the value in our loans here. So I'm going to let him kind of explain uh, briefly. Uh, this would be transferred, would be on our warning at our annual meeting in May to transfer these to the uh, select board as well, leaving EFUD with uh, strictly running the water and sewer system at that point. Okay, so. So this was, again, first broached in December at that joint meeting that we had back then. Um, and um, when I made the proposal that the town use $600,000 of ARPA funds to uh, grant to 
to appropriate EFUD so that they could do uh, water improvement projects outside the district's limits in places where they already are able to serve uh, and do some upgrades in those, in those places. Uh, the quid pro quo that I recommended at the time was that uh, EFUD would get that $600,000 and then turn over its two revolving loan funds to the town. And this is a double-sided sheet. There's the UDAG fund on the one side, which is a much longer report, and then a uh, simple report on the uh, community development block grant funds. Anyway, for those of you who don't know, uh, $630,000 of an urban development action grant was granted by the federal government to the village of Waterway, a direct grant back in uh, 1984. That money was granted to the village uh, with the express intent of the village turning around and lending that money to Ben and & Jerry's. And that allowed Ben & Jerry's with other financing to uh, you know, leverage the $630,000. Uh, and they uh, secured other financing and capital to build their uh, factory and tourist center on Route 100. Um, that $630,000 loan was deferred for about five years, and then uh, they were on an amortization schedule, paid it back in about 10 years, if my recollection is correct. That $630,000 was lent to Ben & Jerry's at the rock bottom interest rate of 9%. Those of you who are old enough to remember uh, Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter before him, when you could buy CDs for 14%, mortgages were going for 18%, you know why 9% uh, was a really good deal at the time yes. for Ben and Jerry's. Um, they paid that back to the village. Uh, when they finished paying it back, it was worth a, a little bit more than a million dollars. Uh, and the village has turned around and uh, has been lending money to other businesses and not-for-profits in this community since that time. Um, on the town's accounting software, I can only go back to 2006. Before that, you have to go look into paper records, and I didn't do that. But since 2006, um, there have been loans made to 20 businesses or not-for-profit organizations. Um, my uh, quick calculation says that more than $1.5 million uh, has been lent out since 2006. Of the 20 that um, uh, received loans, uh, 12 have paid them back completely. Uh, there's eight others um, that are still outstanding now. And uh, we had two loans that did default. It's a pretty good uh, rate that I think most banks would, would be envious of. Uh, there were two businesses that uh, had been loaned about $75,000 altogether between the two of them. And they both failed uh, before they fully repaid the loan and they went out of the business. Um, you can see looking at the balance sheet, well, it's not a balance sheet, but the, the listing of uh, assets and liabilities here. Um, as of December 31st, 2021, there's, it was about $416,000 in cash, uh, about $230,000 in mutual funds, uh, for the total cash and investment value of about 650000 that would be available to be lent out to other businesses. Um, there's uh, $1.1 million outstanding in, in loans and accrued interest uh, outstanding right now. And, um, you know, the way accounting works, uh, all of those loans, even though they're all performing, uh, the uh, accountants uh, consider that to, to be a deferred revenue, meaning that we can't get our hands on that $1.1 million within a 60-day period. Uh, the only way we could make claim on that money is if, if those uh, borrowers were in default. So the fund balance is, is really what we have in cash and investments. Uh, we have made a couple of loans in the past couple of years. And the idea is that uh, because 
the town has appropriated the $600,000 of aqua funds to EFUD. EFUD will go to its um, voters in May at their annual meeting and ask the voters to turn this revolving loan fund over to the town. And if they say no, then EFUD doesn't get the $600,000 of aqua funds. Um, uh, you can see we made uh, $166,000 of loans in 2021. Um, that was to the Beer Shepherd and to the, um, it's called Perry Hill Partners, but it's the, the new building, the Bell Block on, on Stowe Street. <laughs> Money was lent to those two businesses. Um, on the other side of the sheet, <laughs> is a community development block grant fund. The town has a CBDG fund as well. Uh, all of the villages or all of EFUD's money is in one, uh, one project right now, the Lad Hall um, affordable housing uh, uh, building down on the south end of the village. Um, of the $74,580 that was in that fund as of December 31st, 72,000 is in a loan to um, Lad Hall and, and about 2,400 is in, is in the bank. Um, the town has a CDBG fund. I think the balance of the towns is about 160,000. Almost all that is into the uh, Lad Hall as well. The town has a non-performing um, a deferred loan, I guess I would call it, with uh, the, the, um, the building up, the cemetery building in Waterbury Center, the housing project that's in there, the town had lent part of its CDBG funds there, but that's deferred with the full expectation when the time comes that that loan will likely be written off, just like uh, EFUD did with the Stimson and Graves building here on Stone Street. So anyway, that's uh, that's the history and kind of the status. So, thank you, Bill, for putting that together. Since I talked, emailed him this morning if he could do this, and uh, <laughs> I think the, since Bill came in '88, it's his skillful management and financial uh, skills with managing this fund that it's uh, grown and. Uh, contribute to the to the growth and development of Waterbury that it has. So we look to pass it on to you folks um, at a vote at our annual meeting. And uh, we have, like I said, kind of limited it to within the village during the village days. So we look for you folks to utilize it within the town and things and continue in the we, uh, we had adopted a few rules yeah. that went with it that you need to look at and review. And right. so. Just again, just for some edification, the CBG funds, uh, both the EFUD and the town CBG funds, have some fair um, restrictive strings on them. So that CDBG money, um, Ronald Reagan came into office and phased out the revenue sharing that uh, Richard Nixon had put in place in the uh, 1960s and early 70s. And when they phased out general revenue sharing to municipalities, they also phased out all direct block, all direct grants to municipalities and they converted into block grants. And the federal government made block grants to the states and then allowed the states to uh, then make uh, grants uh, to to the uh, municipalities. So the CDBG funds, the ones that have been lent to uh, Ladd Hall and the Stimson Graves building and, and the seminary building, uh, there's a provision in those funds that says that um, when you make a loan to those two organizations, you have to show that 51% of the beneficiaries are gonna be low or moderate income uh, eligible people. So if you lent money to a business, they would have to, and they were going to be creating 20 jobs, 11 of those jobs would have to be offered to somebody in the low and moderate income range with the hope that they would 
grow out of the low and moderate income range. They don't have to stay there, but that's who gets the jobs first. The UDAG funds, because they were made uh, prior to the federal government changing its rules, there are almost no restrictions on the UDAG funds. Um, when I came here and we were doing the closeout work with the federal government, I, I called people who worked for HUD at the time in, in uh, Concord, New Hampshire. They were, the, they were the office that oversaw what we were doing. And I had to make certain reports there. And I said, you know, can you give me a hint about what we can do with this money? And the guy said, I can do one better. I can tell you, he said, the list of what you can't do is a lot shorter than the list that you can do. And he's basically said, you're really not supposed to use this money to do something for general government purposes. So in other words, you shouldn't use the UDAG funds to build a fire station. Uh, but you want to give it to the ICE Center, you want to lend it to somebody to do housing, you want to set up a program to let people you know, paint the facades of their houses, you can do basically what you want with it. So that UDAG fund, is uh, very well, uh, it's uh, very nimble in that you can do a lot with it. And, you know, the village and, and, and EFUD now have lent it to businesses, they've lent it to uh, uh, organizations like Revitalize the Waterbury, who used it to help uh, purchase and renovate the railroad station. They lent it to, um, organizations like Downstreet for housing projects, they've lent it to not-for-profits like the ICE Center. So there's a myriad of things that can be done with it. So I, I think it would be a great asset for the town. You know, how do you set the interest rates? Um, just come to the, uh, right now to the EFUD commissioners and talk to them about it. Uh, in the early days, most of the loans that we were making were um, were kind of loans that put a project over the top. In other words, somebody wanted to do a particular project, they needed $100,000, and they went to the Northfield Savings Bank, and the Northfield Savings Bank said, well, you know, we can take $75,000, but go see, uh, uh, you know, SBA. Uh, and then they'd go to SBA and SBA would say, well, you know, you got a revolving loan fund in your town, go work with them. So there's some loans that we're kind of in third position. The bank is first, SBA is second, and we're third. And oftentimes, you know, the bank's interest rate is going to be at a market rate. The SBA's rate is going to be a little bit lower. And, and we've often worked to with the with the with the borrowers to say okay you know uh, let's target this so that your melded rate is a little bit more affordable so there's there's no um, specific uh, formula to set that it's really I review the financial statements come and talk to the boards talk to the individuals. Uh, we have rates right now uh, ranging from a low of 2% to uh, probably the highest rate that we have out right, right now is probably 4.5%. A, a lot of that, Roger, is dependent upon when the loan was given, just like I talked about with Ben and Jerry's, you know, loans that we made uh, 15 years ago when interest rates were a little higher, they have a little higher rates. Right now, um, all of the loans outstanding are suspended for principal and interest payments and all of the interest rates are at 0% right now. Uh, the commissioners did that when COVID hit in order to try to help keep these businesses going. Um, the ICE Center, for example, um, they have a, they've got a, a loan with a, uh, with, a, with a commercial bank as well they, the bank agreed to say to them, you don't have to make a payment, but they left the interest rate running. So if they didn't make a payment, you know, their $300,000 loan was going to be going up by six and a half percent. So right now, uh, none of these loans are, um, we're not asking anybody to make a payment. 
I'm expecting, uh, you know, the e-fund commissioners did that. They suspended it for six months and we reevaluated. They suspended it another six months. I'm ex I expect by the time that this is turned over to the town, maybe they'll have started them up again. Uh, and we'll probably talk to all of the uh, borrowers out there. You know, we might, um, we might work with them to, uh, you know, adjust their interest rates and even their, their terms. I mean, there's there's some, and I know they won't be upset if I use them as an example, but Sunja's Oriental Foods, for example, um, you know, they were lent originally probably $25,000. And they, they paid on that. Then they borrowed a little bit more money. And, um, you know, there were times and the, the policy and the way that I've always approached this and the recommendations that I've made to the commissioners is, you know, we're not a bank. We're, we're trying to help these people uh, succeed in a business that, that they can provide a business in the community. So, you know, if they miss a payment, we're not right there, you know, ready to shut it down. And, uh, you know, there were some businesses that had, you know, 10 year loans that took 15 or 16 years to pay them off, but they paid them all off with interest. So uh, I think this is a fund that we have always tried to work with the uh, with the lend with the borrowers to make it work for them because having their, their businesses or their organizations in the community have been worthwhile from the public standpoint. That's good explanation. Early on in some of the loans, one of the phrases I remember was prime plus one is what we, because we weren't secured and everything that we used to use and stuff. So anyway, it will be added to your workload if it passes. So I have one quick question for you, Skip. Uh, I, do you have scheduled, I know you have scheduled your EFUD commissioner's annual meeting. Is it going to be in person? Or, yeah. Okay, it is going to be in person. It, it'll be kind of a joint. Okay, hybrid kind of thing, but you'll have it in person so you can discuss what we're discussing now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's all I want because this is something that's difficult if it's just to, it's, if it's remote, just a Australia ballot kind of a, a yes or no, it's probably good that people understand. We had had one public meeting on the transfer of the properties. We haven't had anything about the transfer of the uh, UDAG funds. Right. So, That's all. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank so you. the last item that we wanted to talk with you for about was the potential merger and the charter and things. And we, um, we had our meeting last week um, in preparation for our annual meeting. And, uh, you know, you had come and talked to our earlier meeting about uh, the process of the manager search and everything. And uh, some of us have been through multiple merger events uh, in the past that weren't successful and things. And uh, as commissioners and things, we felt there was uh, taking up the work of finding the manager was going to be a tremendous workload. And we haven't changed our mind about, um, you know, an eventual merger, but we don't think it's doable to work on it this year um, with the manager search. So mm -hmm. um, we agreed among us that it would be put off for a year. Um, you know, we'll transfer hopefully the property and the loans. We'll everything will be done with water and sewer. That whether there's a merger or not will continue, and it's something that um, you know, if it's delayed a year or two, there's no uh, uh, no consequence of it, and it gives the new manager an opportunity to kind of weigh in, and maybe we can uh, convince Bill to work on a merger committee in the future once he's no longer manager and things. So that's our consensus at this point. We hope that you would agree um, and things that uh, it would be taken up after the new manager is hired and in the next year. So 
province of the board. I was just wondering, is the uh, manager and the new manager going to be the manager of uh, the utility district as well? Well, if we agree. <laughs> uh, that's the intent. Yeah. I, I would say that's a 95% chance. It's not something we want to go out and do on our own. It would have to be built into the job description. And, yeah. Okay. You know, stuff. So uh, I was thinking that perhaps you were trying to put this all together and get it through so that the manager had one slate to work off from uh, before he was hired. Uh, I was thinking that you were, trying to, you were trying to simplify it. That's what I had. That was my vision when I presented it back in uh, December, Chris, and then, you know, even as we talked in budget times. But uh, I think as time went on, it, it wasn't necessarily me. From my perspective, you know, it, it should be really simple right now. But I think that in addition to the merger that, that um, could maybe happen without too much difficulty, I think that um, there's been some discussion about including a charter for the town, mm -hmm. uh, and that that becomes a lot of work. So yeah, charter has to be a charter by the legislature. Yeah, yeah, a little more scary. That's a big Do those need to be done in parallel or in succession, or can go either way? Uh, I think Carol is the easiest yeah, way yeah. to do it. When, you know, Skip talked about mergers. So there's been at least a half a dozen merger uh, votes right. in the 34 years that I've been here. Maybe I'm missing one. But there's been at least six. And what, what, was, what happened in every instance was the merger document was written in a fashion that it actually was the charter mm -hmm. for the new town. So... There was provisions at the beginning talking about you know the assets and liabilities of the village being you know uh, subsumed by the town and blah blah blah. But then it laid out how the town would be run in the future. I think that's the most efficient way to do it. But it's still it's it's a lot of work. What's the realistic timeline for that process? Well, in the processes that we've done in the past, we've had a, a vote usually at town meeting or a village meeting in March. And it was always either bring it back to the next annual meeting. Uh, there were cases where it was bring it back so the boards can make a decision whether they want to call a special. Sorry, meeting. I mean the timeline, like for doing the actual work of the merger and drawing up a charter. Well, that's what I'm saying. So okay. at town meeting and at village meeting in March, mm -hmm. there was an article on the warnings that right. said, shall the select board appoint a merger committee? Shall the, the village appoint a merger committee? They passed, the two boards appointed their committees and, and at that charge, at that meeting in March, it was bring back for vote at the next annual meeting. One year, we brought it back for vote in November because the vote happened when there was a presidential mm -hmm. election. So, you know, it, I think it's a, it's a, you know, back then, the first mergers that we were talking about was two full service municipalities. And, those generally took a, a year before they came to a vote, and, and the merger committees met a couple times a month. You know, in the summer they took a little time off, right. so it's it's months worth of work. You know, and there's a lot of informational meetings that go on, and, and right. you have to vote on it. And then it goes to the legislature and, and things. So you're talking like a 18 month, two year process. It oh. could be as much. To, and I think the only way, the best way to do it is the town develops its charter, which merges everything. Because there are some things EFUD wants to kind of watch out for and, you know, and, and that are our concern that I, people in the town have already talked to me about some things they'd like to see in a town charter. We've discussed the op local option chat. Mm -hmm. Of option tax in the, the past and things, and you need provisions to do that in your charter if you ever wanted to do it. You don't have to do it in things. 
So uh, it's plus we want to spend some time educating the select board on what the water department does, what the sewer department does, <clears throat> visit the facilities and, uh, you know, have, so we want to educate the board too by the time we talk about the merger. So by the time we come together, you have a good understanding of what we do and what. Um, and is there a possibility that you could be beneficial in the education of the pros and cons of a charter as well? So you yeah. know you've had one and it's, yeah. You because know. essentially that's what the village did. We wrote a charter for the utility district as we gave up the charter for the village and kind of merged it into the you know, restrictions of what the utility district could do. So just my opinion is just as much as it's, I think it's nice that if we could wrap this up in one nice little package, I don't want to rush it. I think there's too much at stake. You know, you don't get too many bites out of the apple when you produce a charter, you want to get it right. So, you know, we're looking at even, we're, we'd be less than a year probably bringing it to the voters. I just think it's too 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 quick, especially with Bill leaving. You know, if, if Bill wasn't leaving, you know, not that I would want him to stay, I want him to enjoy his retirement, but I think, that's really where the focus is. And if we can make some of these other transfers, it's just going to simplify things. And my opinion. What's your pleasure? What's, what's the board's pleasure? Does the board do we need to do anything? I don't think there's any action. I don't think that's so right now. to make a move. Yeah. Do we have any, not, Motion, but do we have any consensus that we want to give 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 to them in regards to merger or anything that we want to recommend? If not, we can just leave it as it is. Yeah. I appreciate them coming forward and uh, giving us uh, their presentation. I was curious about what the plan was for the merger, and uh, also uh, I think this uh, plan for the transfer of property uh, and a quid pro quo for the uh, $600,000 for the upgrade of the water system that the uh, uh, overall market with uh, uh, new, uh, new flats uh, is, a, is a great deal. So appreciate the information. This is a big step forward compared to some of the meetings oh, some yeah. of us have been to in the past. So, <laughs> you know, it, uh, yeah, I think we're making progress. Yeah. And, um, when you've spent 34 years working on it, what's another year? <laughs> <laughs> we all want to be able to shake your hand and be happy that what happened <laughs> was a good thing. You yeah. know, and for all of us, yeah, we want you to see it through. I've long <laughs> said that good things take a little longer. So this is one of those things. Yep. Anything else? If not, we'll move on to the next item. Get the box. Update on personnel <laughs> policy. Phil? Yeah, so um, for most of the EFA commissioners, this is uh, this is something that they'll maybe have bad memories of. And even Chris Jens, uh, the rest of the select board didn't have to go through this process. Um, but last year, the library commissioners uh, started, they had some issues with staffing and they were uh, asking about the personnel policy. The personnel policy that we have for the town in Ufad, uh is quite old when it comes to personnel policies. It goes back to 1992 and it really has had few, if any, modifications since then, although we have tried a couple of different times. Uh, the last time was shortly after the flood. Uh, and Chris and Skip and all the EFUD commissioners, except for Cindy, uh, probably remember some of the meetings. And um, as I said earlier in the meeting, uh, you know, there's two municipalities here. Uh, they have two different uh, legislative bodies, but we have one unified staff. From me down, I've tried to uh, uh, basically uh, 
ask the people who work here, even though you get a, a pay stub that's blue, you're the town employee, you get a pay stub that's pink, you're the uh, village or ethyl employee, uh, we all work for the same uh, community in the same municipality. So we try to work together. Uh, but you've got to get both boards to adopt the policy. And uh, we kind of moved the personnel policy discussion 95 yards down the field and kind of fumbled on the five yard line. And that was back in 2014, 15, probably. And um, we ended up then kind of staff, in particular me, uh, got sidetracked in that we were building this building and all of our energies went here and we kind of never picked it up. Um, the last item that was kind of contentious was, you know, do we want this to be an at-will personnel policy? And we can explain later what that means. Or do we want to spell out progressive discipline that has to be um, you know, it's stipulated in the policy that if you don't perform it in a, in a fashion that your supervisor thinks is reasonable, that there's prescribed steps that have to be taken. And we never got over that hump. And then, you know, I was happy enough to just leave it. And fortunately, from my perspective, we've had very few issues with employees here in my tenure. Right? I did fire two employees in the time that I've been here. One was within the first year that I arrived. I was a village employee, and then one was a town employee back a couple of years before the flood. Um, we've had a few minor issues, but you know we've all managed to get along. So having a personnel policy that that really works, fortunately, hasn't been necessary. But um, when the library commissioner started asking about it last fall, I dusted it off again, and I've taken the opportunity to send it to uh, a lawyer. His name is John Klesch. He works for the legal firm of um, Stitzel, Page & Fletcher, which is the same firm that we use for most of our municipal law right now. And uh, last week, finally, um, he's had some delays in his uh, in his process. He finally transmitted it back to me last week. So my hope is that sometime in the next couple of weeks, I'll meet with him to get the lay of the land and have him explain it to me. And then uh, I'm hopeful, those of you who remember the one that we looked at before, at least when you look at this one, you'll be reminded of the one that we looked at seven or eight years ago. Uh, it's not very different, except it's updated, you know, and, and that's really where the failure is, is that, uh, you know, labor law gets updated by both Congress and the legislature rather regularly. So anyway, um, I will be getting that information to you in the coming weeks. And again, it, from my perspective, it will be best if it, uh, if a joint meeting is held, because I really think it's critical until we merge that everybody that works here works under the same policy, even though there's two different boards that have to approve. So anyway, that's the end. If you have questions, I can answer them now, but probably easier when we talk about it. This attorney, is he specialized in like labor law? He does a lot of labor work. Okay. Awesome yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, clarity in, in, in the last five, ten years, it's amazing how all these issues. And if you don't have it in writing, you're in big trouble. Yeah. It seems as though personnel policies are similar to zoning regs. They're never quite complete. <laughs> and, uh, there's always something. Chris, we could do both this year. You know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that a challenge? <laughs> They're also like zoning regulations. And, in, in that you don't need them until you need them. Right? <laughs> exactly. If not, is there anything else? We're done with the section that probably a joint meet, meeting. Your the commissioners are welcome to stay, but is there anything else you wish to bring up? Um, 
Well, we look forward to working with you on these things and uh, sounds like the beginning of uh, a number of joint issues to work on, even without merging. So mm -hmm. good uh, partnerships are, are a good thing. <laughs> So I think with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the uh, EFUD commissioner's uh, joint part of the meeting. Make a motion to adjourn. A second? A second. Motion has been made and seconded to adjourn the joint session of the EFUD commissioner's meetings for March 21st. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> And we thank you for the pleasure of uh, with you and the uh, surprise. You. It's always a great meeting with all you guys. It's always, a pleasure, it's always a pleasure to see the neighbors once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially these days. Yes. You know? <laughs> and without a mask <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> okay, we're popping. Okay, we'll yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the manager's item. Staff reports on the town highways, the mud. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> oh boy. Alyssa and, and Roger are, are new, and uh, I don't know if you got any complaints yet, but the, the, the roads, the gravel roads in town are in tough, tough shape. Um, they're in tough shape almost everywhere in the, in the region. Um, I have seen worse, but it's been a long time since I've seen worse. Um, and if you read the uh, article that Lisa printed the other day in the paper, um, you know, we're just up against uh, Mother Nature, which is always the fact, but we've had a couple of kind of odd curveballs uh, the last week or so. You know, we had 12 inches of snow back the weekend before last, uh, and then three or four days after the snow fell, it was 65 degrees and sunny. Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, we, um, we, you know, really since uh, the beginning of last week, haven't had any freezing temperatures either. And when mud season typically comes, you know, a good uh, mud season is kind of helped the same way that sugar season is, that warm days and cold nights. And when I say warm days, you know, warm days like 42 or 45 are nice, some cloud cover. Um, the road crew worked, um, you know, Celia was out and several of the crew members were out for almost 48 hours straight mm -hmm. last week and they did take a little break, but somebody was out at all times uh, right through uh, Friday over the weekend. Uh, on Friday in particular, we had issues on both Gray Hill and, and Perry Hill where cars were actually stuck. And we had to close portions of the road. Uh, on Perry Hill, everyone could get home from one direction or the other. They just couldn't go all the way through. Mm -hmm. On Greg Hill, um, you know, we had people that really weren't able to get home. Uh, it is improving a little bit. Today was a much better day, even though it was, you know, well above freezing. It was uh, somewhat cloudy. It only got into the low 40s. And it was windy, and and the road they are beginning to dry out a little bit. We've uh, placed our materials. Uh, it's you know Woody spent most of the day. Bill Woodruff, the public works director, spent uh, most of the day on Friday trying to arrange trucks to haul stone for us because all of our crew was working and we couldn't haul haul it ourselves. So I spoke to Celia this morning, and I spoke to Bill. Woodruff a couple of times today. We seem to be making some progress. Supposed to freeze tonight, supposed to freeze tomorrow night, uh, which will allow them to go out and you know when it's when it's a little firmer, they can scrape things a little bit, try to get the ruts out. I mean, I can show you pictures of my road uh, where I'm only going down over this hill right now, and that's bad enough. The in the vicinity of Road is the ruts are that I wouldn't drive, you know, 
I, I stopped both yesterday and today and looked and tried to pick out the high spots from the line. So I'm going to turn that. So uh, anyway, if you get comments, we've been getting a lot of phone calls here. Most people are very understanding. There's some people who are like they want you to come up right now and put a steel plate on their road and help them, you know, be able to go where they want. The worst part of it is that, you know, there's always some people who just, even though they don't have to drive on the ground road, they're lucky enough to live on a paved road, they have to go decide to see what it's like and they just <laughs> make it worse. So uh, the school buses, buses yeah. the school buses today and tomorrow have been asked not to go on to the Owl Road. So there's a little inconvenience with some of the parents of school age kids. Um, hopefully by Wednesday they'll be able to uh, do their normal routes, but it is so. I kind of wonder how many people have just recently moved up here in the last year. Uh. Front porch forum. Yeah, they've been up on front porch forum. Where did we get our step in? There's, there's a couple. There's, <laughs> it's, it's the fifth problem. season problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they didn't know we have a fifth season. <laughs> that's, yeah. the, that's the status report. Uh, if anybody should call you and complain vigorously, certainly direct them to talk <laughs> to me. Uh, I'll tell them what I told you. We're doing the best we can. And it's just, you're going to have to wait until conditions improve before it gets take, better. Take the a look at drive. some of the videos on the internet and your problems are probably not as bad as some of those. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the update. Thanks for the Thank town you. staff. Yeah. yeah. Work. Tell them to give them. Tell them. Give them more thanks. Buy them a. Can't, can't say a beer, but uh, you should buy them the chips. <laughs> okay. All right. New board member orientation. Yeah, I don't have anything for tonight. Um, sporadically over the next couple of months, I will bring information to the board uh, specifically. I hope that will be helpful for. Alyssa and Roger, but we'll do some refreshers for you. Um, as I talked about early in the meeting, um, there, has there been a VLCT training scheduled yet? Yes, yes. yes. Schedule. It's, it's scheduled. Yep. It's scheduled. Okay. I would encourage even veteran members to attend if you can. They're always very helpful. But we will understand that. Much of the training that they'll do at the select board uh, uh, training sessions will be directed to the 240 towns that don't have town managers. There's about 40 or 45 towns in the state that have municipal managers uh, and uh, not administrators, true municipal managers. And managers have authority to do almost everything that the select board has authority to do in Duxbury, for example. So in Duxbury, the select board hires the staff uh, as, a, as a board. In Waterbury, the municipal manager hires the staff. In Duxbury, they supervise the staff. I don't have any problem with you talking to employees in the town to get a general sense of what's going on and stuff like that. I would ask you, don't give them any direction. Don't tell them, go here and take care of this railroad or go there and do this. Or, you know, we, I want you to implement another recreation program. Your job is to set uh, policies and procedures and point in a direction for the time to go. And then it's my job to direct the staff to get there. Um, the the uh, manager is the purchasing agent of the municipality. The manager is the chief financial officer, has the uh, responsibility and the authority to uh, manage the finances of the town and to execute the budget. So we've just come through town meeting, uh, spent uh, weeks and you know a month and a half basically from mid-December through January working with the select board with the budget. Um, I present a budget to the select board. The select board 
asks questions, makes decisions, and the select board votes on the budget that gets submitted to the voters, and then the voters approve it. Once the budget is approved, then it's up to the municipal manager to execute that budget. And I don't say this in any way to say that I'm a control freak. I think those of you who know me, I, I, I work very collaboratively. Um, from a management style, I am a very uh, hands-off manager. I, I don't micromanage people. I pretty much believe that most of the employees know their jobs and what they have to do a lot more than I know what their jobs are. I just want to make sure that they produce what needs to be produced so that we can run it down. So if you have concerns about something, if somebody calls you and expresses concern about uh, not being satisfied with a particular service or with a particular employee, I would encourage you not to engage that employee yourself. Come and talk to me, let me deal with it. Um, but anyway, that's all I need to say for tonight. Um, go to the training if you can. It's, it's good overall training, but um, and feel free to ask whoever the presenter mm -hmm. is, you know, how might this differ if it's a town with a town manager? You know, from library, we have a town manager. And, and they'll be able to, to help a little bit. But the training in general is good, it's worthwhile, and I would encourage you to do it. Um, pretty much what will happen going forward is, uh, I, I try to make a financial presentation to the board once a quarter. Um, some places do it monthly. I think that's a little bit overkill here uh, for a variety of reasons. We have a pretty large and complicated budget. We have a lot of different funds. Um, so trying to you know present that information once a month, I think is too much. But on a quarterly basis, I will come to you. Uh, usually the, the second meeting after the quarter ends, sometime depending on the calendar, it might be the first meeting after the quarter ends. So the quarter will end on March 31st. Our first meeting after March 31st will be April 4th. I won't be ready then. So um, April 18th, I'll probably make a, present, a financial presentation to you. And I'll do that um, every, every quarter, or at least attempt to do that. But anytime, uh, if you have questions about something, I would ask that you, uh, you know, certainly call me. Uh, if you want to be uh, brought up to speed on uh, the budget in general or any particular fund, make an appointment. I'm happy to meet with you. My door is almost always open. Uh, I probably know I like to talk. <coughs> I can listen to, but uh, you know, there's usually not a uh, there's not a want for words. And, and if you think I'm being too detailed, tell me like my wife does. Um, I had something built. Yeah, this this kind of a new board orientation. This is something that's, to be quite honest, always I'm I'm always in a quandary. We all get a lot of people will email board members. Anyone from just one person, but usually they'll email all five of us. I don't know if we want to have. You know, I always tended not to. I know Bill sometimes will, and sometimes Bill's engaged in that too. Bill will respond. I don't know if we want to have a protocol on how we want to speak to, you know, residents, you know, how we, you know, you know, I hate that if, if someone asks something and they get five different responses from all of us. Yeah, you really need to be careful uh, I, when, when somebody emails you right. and and they send an email and all five select board members are copied and Carl is copied and all right. copied. Um, any one of you may respond, but you should you can respond to all if you want, but you need to take the other four select board members right. off because if you start if you engage then you run afoul of the public meeting law, or at least you can be accused of, of having a uh, discussing public issues outside of a one meeting. Yeah, so I you. always recommend that, uh, you know, if you want to send an email to Mike, 
and you want to send the same email to Chris and to Danny and to Alyssa and Roger, depending on which one of you, you can send individual emails, but you should not send an email to two people at the same time because then there's three of you conducting business by email. And right. that has already been found in the Bob case law to be a violation of the open meeting law. Right. So be careful when you respond. If and people often, I won't say always, are owed a response. Sometimes when they're mean and nasty and all they're trying to do is get under your skin. A, a lot of times I write the response and then I read it. And then I read it. <laughs> Don't get that sent, but but um, you know, try not to respond to all and include your board members on it. But don't be afraid to respond. And if the person gets two or more answers about something, you can always talk about it at, at a future meeting. But uh, you know, they are your constituents, and uh, they have an expectation that mm -hmm. you're going to listen to what they have to say and write and you should. If it's an opinion or something I know for sure I know the answer to, I always reply. Something big, I'll often just forward it to Bill right. and say, did you get this? Or I saw that you got this. I don't really know what to do next. Yeah. And, and that, that, that's, that's always, that's, that, is, <clears throat> that is also appropriate. If, if you get an email, whether everyone's contacted or not, if you feel that you shouldn't answer this, or you don't have the information to answer it, certainly forward it to me, and I'll do my best to, to answer it. And typically, I will copy you on the answer that I, that I said. I used to be sometimes hesitant because I said, is the chair going to respond or something, you know, for that? And I'm not saying I want to respond, respond to all emails and whatnot, because I think every one of us is capable. Right. But, you know, sometimes, if if they get three different answers, that concerns me too. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's just stating that. Sorry. Yeah. You know, I was just gonna say I've, I've already run afoul of this uh, because a uh, constituent uh, emailed uh, all of us about uh, the use of beet juice uh, on the roads to avoid uh, yeah. corrosion of cars, <laughs> and uh, because it's more effective when you, uh, than just the, the regular salt brine. And uh, I responded to all like, yeah, it seems like an interesting idea, but uh, you know, quick financial analysis would give us some idea as to whether this is going to see the light of day. Um, and then I participated in the uh, open meeting uh, mm -hmm. series from the LCT, and I said never <laughs> no, 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 respond no. by email. To everybody, so I realize. Yeah, it, it's it's a common it's a common mistake, and you know it's it seems like the obvious thing to do because it's so easy to do it, and right. most people don't think that they're in a meeting. And I would agree; I don't think you're really in a meeting, but unfortunately, the courts can be so. mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I, I don't want to take up too too much time here. Um, just just uh, if we could, I mean, I, I would. Uh, perhaps, Mike, you could step forward and answer on behalf of uh, the, uh, or just if if you think it's appropriate for a response, and then send it to each one of you individually. I, I just I don't know. I mean, it seems as though the the the, the, the constituent right. is looking for a response. Right. It's inappropriate for any of us to to answer right. for all of us. Although, like I know. From working with Chris and working with Danny, I kind of know what their maybe more expertise are, and maybe just email Chris or Danny yeah. and say, "Hey, could you answer this one?" Yeah, that that's <laughs> fine. And, and you need you do need to be careful if it's an obvious answer. You know, uh, who's the hiring right. foreman? Well, you can say it's still the client. Yeah, that's but, that's an easy. One. But if there's if there's a if there's a question and you believe it's kind of a more of a policy question, mm -hmm. procedural question, and you're unsure, then the best thing to do is say, you know, that's a good question. We'll put it on a future on agenda, agenda and, and mm -hmm. discuss it because you know Mike's opinion of that might not be what the board's feeling is. So mm -hmm. you just have to be right. And you'll you'll get the feel of it. It will become second nature to you over time. So before we move on, 
Roger just reminded me of something, and uh, I want to back up a little bit and just make sure that I mention it because I was asked to mention it, and so was Roger. It's back to the road issue. Mm -hmm. um, concerned citizen was upset that the roads weren't in better condition. We already discussed that, but his concern was emergency vehicles. Uh, his father had to have an ambulance try to get to his place, and it was apparently pretty difficult. Um, yeah. And, you know, we can, as humans, control a fair amount of things in our life, but one thing we can't control is Mother Nature's wrath on us. And uh, this spring and mud season is just a little drop in the bucket of what Mother Nature. Uh, if you read Lisa's article, you know, she talked to Gary Dillon about that. And Gary said, you know, we, we do our best to get there. And there have been times where, you know, when they have a call, they call Celia, they call the highway department, somebody goes out, they try, you know, oh, but okay. that, that takes time. I mean, if you need to get a grader out there to try to push the mud aside, we do what we can. And unfortunately, there's no perfect scenario. And, uh, you know, we, there's no fast fix to this. No. And, and you and I talked about it a little bit this afternoon. Um, I have, I had occasion last week to drive into Harvey Farm, and I was with Ingrid, my wife. And we went in, uh, we had to go drop something off at somebody's house that lived there. And she said, wow, their road's pretty good. I said, yeah, because their road was built to modern day construction standards. And it wasn't just a road that was cut through the woods and, you know, so uh, we threw some gravel down there and there's no base and, and the rest of it. And, you know, we've got a lot of miles of road and it's a lot of money to do that. Uh, we're trying to improve things as, as time goes by, but it, it's a reality of rural life and it's here, it's- We do what we can. Let's, let's move on. Um, so quickly, quickly one, other thing that I need to tell you is that um, I think they should adopt the motion to allow one of them. Yeah, to I was just going to ask you to briefly orders. explain the warrants and that motion. Yeah, so, uh, okay. so I told you a minute ago that I'm the chief financial officer and I, I take care of all of the town's finances and responsible for getting the bills paid. Carla is the treasurer. We have a process. Uh, in place we we'll make sure we try as best as possible to make embezzling difficult to do not that i think we have any embezzlers on the staff but we've got systems in place um, that prevent certain people from doing too many things in the financial process so uh, when a when a bill comes in to be paid the department head or i uh, We'll put that bill with an expense coding sheet directing the bookkeeper which line item on the budget to debit uh, and make that payment for. Uh, she produces all the checks and with the checks produces a, a warrant that needs to be signed. Uh, up until about 15, 20 years ago, uh, the warrant had to be signed by a majority of the select board. Uh, and it was typically done at a meeting, but we pay bills and, and do payroll every week. We only do <coughs> um, have meetings twice a month. So that was a little bit problematic and many times we're in that position. The legislature changed the law uh, a number of years ago now and will allow a town to, uh, a legislative body of a town to make a motion to the effect that uh, only one signature is necessary on a warrant order, and any select board member is able to sign the warrant. So if that motion is made tonight, what that means is that any one of you is able to come in every week and sign the warrants. The warrant has to be signed. Uh, I don't, the warrants have to be signed before the checks are earned. Our man uh, uh, by a member of the legislative body. So any one of you can do it, but one of you has to do it. 
if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. And when we have meetings, typically Carolyn brings the, the warrants to the meeting and somebody signs it before the meeting. But on the weeks that there's no meeting, somebody needs to come in. The boards have always worked it out amongst themselves. Sometimes one person has done it always. Sometimes there's been alternating people do it. But I would encourage you to make the motion to authorize one select board member uh, that, that the warrant may be signed by one select board member and that any select board member may sign the warrant. Can, I assume we can still do it, Carla, by, you know, reviewing it and scanning, you know, a sign thing to mm -hmm. you or, or we're not or past yeah. there. Okay. The warrant may be signed by one select board member. And that any select board member may sign the warrant. Right. So move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Well, just to let people know, I won't sign orders unless I'm sitting at the table looking at it, reviewing the That's fine. reviewing the bills individually. That's fine. And you have typically done that before meetings. Yep. You're willing to still do that? Absolutely. I I, I prefer to come in. Yeah, he yeah. texted. Me. I was going to bring him tonight, but he texted me and said this is going to be a long meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to have to deal with yeah. it tonight, so I'll come in in the morning. Okay. But my so that on the other on that other, that same note, um, at some point here in the next few weeks, maybe even less than that, because I've already got some equipment out, I'll start back up for my summer stretch, mm -hmm. endless days. Uh, so at that point, I'll you know ask one of you guys to take that. I don't mind. I don't mind signing them during the winter because I've got the time to do it. But once my summer stretch starts, I'm happy to still email them. Yeah, that's, so that you can all see them. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Sending the email yeah. too. You can see good. what's being paid. You can see payroll. Mm -hmm. And if I, I, I usually if I have a, if I see something that doesn't sound really right, you know, I don't need to see necessarily. But if something sounds, I call Carla and say, "What's this?" And she says. You know, there have been a few, but not many. You know, I can figure out what one of the things are. Sometimes I remember the first one, I didn't know everyone who was on the payroll, and I figured those were all the firemen. So that kind of, you know, you'll figure it out after seeing enough of the warrants. Um, and that, Alyssa added something in this section for the first week. Oh, we have a vote. Sorry. Yeah. There was a lot yeah. of discussion. Yeah. Uh, so if we could have a vote, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No opposed. Uh, motion carries. And next item is authority for tax anticipation borrowing. No, oh, I got yeah. that last. Okay, got it. I got gotcha. you. But thank you, Sure. Okay. So tax anticipation borrowing. Um, our fiscal year starts on January 1st. We don't have a, an approved budget really until the first week of April because we have to wait until 30 days after town meeting before people can petition up to 30 days after town meeting to have a special meeting called to rescind any action that has been taken. So we're still in that uh, 30 day window. But once the uh, once the 30 days passes, we will have a budget. Uh, but even in some years, not this year, but our budget year starts January 1st, and we have expenses that we have to pay all year long. Um, about 78, 80% of all of our revenue are property tax uh, revenues. Uh, and then, you know, intergovernmental transfers and, and fees and things that people pay for recreation or town clerk's fees and the like. Um, so sometimes we don't have our cash flow is such that we run out of money before we get our tax collection. Uh, first tax collection date isn't until August. And on occasion, in fact, it used to be every year, but it's not now. Um, we need to borrow in anticipation of taxes to do that. Um, tonight, what I'm going to ask you to do is grant authority if necessary to borrow in anticipation of taxes to borrow it from uh, EFUD. 
uh, a number of years ago, 20 years ago, I, I talked to Paul Giuliani, the municipal attorney, uh, our block counsel, and said, you know, we typically borrow from the People's United Bank, but we've got a sister municipality here, all of whom are town members. You know, Roger lives in the village, Alyssa lives in the village, uh, Danny, we used to live in the village. Uh, it's been a long time since we've had three people <laughs> on, the, on the board. Carol in the okay. mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I said, you know, we have a system municipality that has a lot of money in the bank. Can we borrow from them and pay interest to the to the village, or in this case, EFUD, rather than pay the interest to people who buy the bank? Yeah, absolutely. You've got to put a note together. You have to charge interest. Um, so. Um, this year, my expectation is we will not have to borrow in anticipation of taxes, or if we do, it will be very little uh, at, at some time, maybe in May or June. Uh, right now, we have over a million and a half dollars in the bank. That's unusual for this time of year. The reason we have that much money in the bank is because we're sitting on seven hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars in proper funds. Um, so you know we can. We, it's funded county, so we've got a fund that shows that money is there, uh, but we can use that money uh, in the normal course of our uh, uh, cash flow spending. So I don't expect that we will have to borrow from EFUD this year. And if we do have to borrow, it will probably be only from EFUD. Uh, last year, it was necessary to actually go to the bank and borrow because we borrowed all of what you fund had and we still need more. Uh, if that's the case, I'll come back at a future meeting with a, with an actual bond anticipation note from the bank. But I've given Danny, I think he's had a, a motion. EFUD uh, authorized this at their meeting last week to borrow, to lend to the town and also if necessary to borrow from the town I'm asking you to, to do the same motion that they did. So, motion to authorize the town treasurer and municipal manager to borrow funds in 2022 in anticipation of taxes from EFUD and to authorize the town to lend funds to EFUD in anticipation of water or sewer revenues, setting a rate for borrowing and lending at 2% per annum. Sure. I'll second it. Any further discussion? No, all in favor? Aye. Aye. That, that, <laughs> that interest rate is close to the market rate. If we went to the bank, it would yeah. probably be two and a quarter, two and a half now. So a little bit of a discounted rate, but uh, it's beneficial both ways. If we have to borrow from the EFUD, it's a much higher interest rate than they're getting on their money, just sitting in the super yeah. route, which is well less than 1% still. Uh, and the tax. Um, isn't paying quite as much as we would have to pay to the bank, and we're also paying it to a sister municipality. So it's a good deal. Okay. We can have all in favor again. Say aye. 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 Any so, opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Audit. Yeah. Uh, Carla has the audit proposal. Yeah, and, uh, we've got an audit actually that's ongoing now. So I Hope that you will. <laughs> they didn't get the uh, they didn't get the, the document to me until just last week. But uh, Sullivan Powers is the firm that we use for our audit, um, and uh, they are proposing to audit the panel's books for. Yeah. Was there a change from last year or $24,000? You know what the fee last year was? was it, somewhere it was around that. Around that. It might be slightly like 24. No, big, no, big, no. Big there, uh, there's so I would ask the board to make a motion to. Uh, accept the engagement letter with Solon and Powers, and if you approve it, then um, both copies need to be signed by the board. Uh, I'll make the motion to accept the uh, letter from Solon and Powers. 
Thank you. So we have a second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Just, just Danny, what, there was a motion and a second to improve the engagement letter from Sullivan Powers. <laughs> Sorry. Has there already been a motion in a second? Yeah. Great. So now, just now we're going. Fantastic. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And on the last page, there's a signature, signature. line. Great. All of you need to sign it. Oh, I forget the time. So is your week going well, though? Is it good week? Are they here today? Well, <laughs> they were here last week last a couple week. days. Oh, they'll so be sure. here later this week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll have an update on CB, CB for fiber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't um, see the agenda. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, my name is Linda Gravel. Uh, the agenda says I'm a car bell. That's ice cream. Well, <laughs> sounds delicious. Sorry about that. I'll fix that. Gravel. Typo. Yeah, typo. Um, Last September, the select board appointed me to be the delegate to CB Fiber. Uh, they appointed Christopher Shank to be the alternate. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that he is a fabulous person to work with. <laughs> we are so lucky to have him. He has uh, handled the recruiting of our executive director, who is coming on board very soon. Yeah. Okay. Has not been announced yet, but um, I was on the recruiting for the executive director and worked with Christopher closely, and he was fabulous. Uh, his technical ability is beyond doubt. Really, he um, he is working on the um, um, planning and development, which is the construction committee, basically, with me, and um, is extremely the vice chair now of that committee. Um, I'm the vice chair of the policy committee. Um, I go to every single committee meeting that CD Fiber has going. Um, except I don't go to the executive the committees, but I go to all the working committees. Um, and I'm uh, the only one I'm not on is the finance committee. I'm on every other committee, which means I'm a voting member. How many meetings is that a month? Um, it's uh, <laughs> uh, these two weeks. Yeah, and special meetings come up too. <laughs> so um, I'm loving it. It's wonderful. Uh, uh, very sad. Appointing us. Um, I am also uh, I'm trying to get you guys to know who I am. Uh, I am also on the Justice of the Peace. Um, so I worked with the select board on the, uh, the Civil Authority Board. So you will see me there also. Um, I am retired. Uh, I have a master's degree in computer science and management from Rensselaer and uh, uh, bachelor's from Northeastern University. Um, I worked in the software development and consulting uh, type arena for my entire career, um, including working for Sovereignet, building the, out the first southern part of Vermont with fiber um, before I started working on this kind of stuff for the CV fiber. Um, I also worked for a, a uh, cybersecurity. Uh, running the East Coast office. Um, so I've got quite a bit of experience. Um, I'm retired now, it's hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Water, Waterbury joined the 21 members of Seabank Fiber Municipal Communication Union District, they are called MDs, to do something it could not do itself. And that is build a high speed 100, 100 megabits fiber network connecting its unserved and underserved households in Waterbury. 
After experiencing the pandemic, I need not tell you how important it is to have every household be connected to the internet. For the kids' education, for our working parents to work remote, for telehealth medicine, and for especially communicating with family and friends. On January 18, uh, 2022, the Vermont Community Broadband Board, it's uh, called C BCBB, issued the Act 71 Broadband Construction Program Request for Proposal to accelerate community broadband de deployment by offering matching funds to the towns in Vermont, who would commit to offer funds to high-speed broadband development. Any application for these matching funds must be submitted by September 15, 2022. That's the deadline. Funds will be distributed, yes, this is important here, first come, first serve basis until the funds are gone. So you may put it in on September 15, only to find funds are not there anymore. And that's why I say time is critical. Water Bay has over 70 miles of construction for the CV fiber network. The estimated cost for the network in Waterbury is 2.95 million. This is an estimate, pretty close to $3 million. For which CV fiber will be short about half the cost at 1.5 million. We are continually uh, applying for more federal grants of all kinds. We are hoping to get more money toward this 1.5 missing part. Um, but if we don't, then the funds have got to come from somewhere else besides grants. This estimate I'm giving you does not include direct connections from the telephone poles to the property owner's homes. That's additional fees. The average connection cost that we can figure, it always depends on how far the driveway is, of course, is estimated at about $1,750 per household. Not a cheap fee. Now, when uh, my husband and I moved into Waterbury, we actually weren't connected to any uh, Comcast or anything else, and uh, had somebody give us an estimate for digging ours, and ours is pretty close to the road. It was about two grand, they estimated. And we went out and dug our own. We got up the specs for both engineers, so it wasn't a problem for us to get up the specs we needed for a uh, very in the conduit. We dug a ditch. Two thousand dollars they were going to charge us to dig a ditch. I was like, wait a minute. So maybe some of these homeowners can, you know, dig a ditch, but they certainly can't wire it from the pole to the house. By law, CD Fiber has no taxing authority. CD Fiber cannot use tax, town tax dollars. Our funds come only from grants, sale of bonds, donations, and subscriber fees. To help us accelerate the development of the network and to keep our subscriber rates as low as possible, CB Fiber is asking the Waterbury Select Board to consider committing 5% of the Waterbury ARPA grant funds to CB Fiber to support the construction of Waterbury's community broadband network. 5% is about $75,000. Do you mind if I ask a question? Absolutely, go ahead. Is that for the 5% uh, represent the town's CB fibers ask of the towns for the entire build out, or is uh, that just for this year? This for this year, so that we can get the matching funds for this year. Basically, we are asking that the select board to apply for the matching funds and thus adding an additional $75,000 to the pot, making it our total $150,000 to be used in the construction of Waterbury's network within town. 
the select board to specify how the funds shall be used within LIBEL. We have an opportunity here to double our whatever you want to commit, but it's kind of a time limited thing. One of the questions I got, and I got some really nice questions from you guys. Um, I'm sorry I had to put it out so late, but I was waiting for my colleagues to put up their notes together for the presentation. And I got some really good questions um, from you folks um, in the last 24 hours. Um, and so I encourage you to keep sending me those questions. Can I ask one clarification of what you just said? Yeah. In this matching fund, you said the town would apply. Does that mean the town of Waterbury would be an applicant for funding? Or is this that the communications union district would leverage hypothetical ARPA funding from our town? Or are you saying that town staff in this theory would need to administer a risk? Um, there is an application process. And I was going to talk about it at the end. Great. If then, then, oh, to... then wait till the end. You just you said that, and I was trying to clarify yeah. what you meant. So now at the end, it's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm glad you're interested in that. <laughs> just the logistics. <laughs> okay. uh, these matching funds are a great opportunity for Waterbury residents to ask the select board to use those funds to connect underserved households from the telephone poles to their homes while at the same time reducing the subscription rates for all the Waterbury residents. Uh, we want to connect everyone, not just the underserved. One of the reasons why all these CUDs got put together is because the, uh, the companies that provide internet saw that it was not a sustainable business model you know, to connect to these people that had uh, two mile long driveways, for example, or were out on Ring Road that you guys were just talking about. And I went up there uh, to talk to the owners this week and barely got out of there. <laughs> so I, I wanted to do this to see what they had to say, what the owners had to say, and um, to go and look at what it, some of the addresses are that uh, are considered underserved or no service. Uh, but CD Fiber will not have a sustainable business model without subscribers from all over town, which means we are going to try to get a subscription rate that is lower than Comcast and the other uh, pub public you know, companies. But if I was work one day, if you're already Comcast subscriber, you know, you have cable, you know, that's already run. Does CB fiber buy that line? I'm just assuming I'm not going to have to redig a ditch. I was wondering that too. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I will try to find out. Okay. Right. That's a real important thing because a lot of us were okay. wired. No, I, I don't think you have to do that. I think it's a connection. You suggested if, if you wanted to change, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Like like going from one propane right. provider. It's uh, like going from a you know, heating company. No, I think the connection at the pool. Yeah. The, okay. the, 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 the line to your house is your line. So if you had, right. it's like the telephone company, you know, if you had, New England Telephone back in the day, and then it became Fairpoint. It's consolidated, right. and then you decided that you wanted to go with somebody, you know, Comcast for your telephone. It just gets yeah. switched out. Like, so the line to your from the pole to your house is your property, right? You're responsible. But like, if you like, we're on a road association. There's lines right. going up to the main road. Right. I'm curious how that would but all work. I, I so I don't want to. I think you're answering the question, Linda, that I asked of you in my email yesterday and that we talked about this morning. But why don't you finish your presentation before I ask any questions? Can I ask a quick question? Very quick. Linda, what is underserved? Oh, no, that's what I was just getting to. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't Straight know. hand. <laughs> She's perfect. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, before I talk about that I'm going to say that I think you guys are very interested whether the voters would be interested in spending money on broadband 
to try to get competition and cheaper rates in Waterbury in particular. That seems to be what I found out from my petitioning and my talking to the, the voters and walking around and done, did a lot of canvassing in the last two weeks just to go and visit people at the list of addresses that I have. And I got a slew of um, people to sign the petition. So I'm gonna pass this around. I got about 140 uh, at people that sign the petition and you can read the petition. I'll just send these around while I'm talking. So I, come, I currently got 140 um, or so on the petition. And I'll go back to your question too, because I knew that would come up. This, uh, the uh, definition of this is actually in the, the letter that you got from the chair of the board um, at CJ Fiber. Uh, why did he write the, uh, the letter is an answer to a question I got. Uh, in an email from one of you folks that said basically, um, how are the other towns doing with this? Um, are, are, are they all putting up money? And we haven't had a lot of towns, uh, but they're all in the same situation that you guys are in. Because it came out, the whole uh, matching funds was announced till the end of January, and everybody is finished their budget by then. And so most of the towns are in the same situation that you guys are in. And so we haven't had a lot of response. And I'm like, why did the, the legislator finally get it to the end of January? Well, they tried to put it in as soon as the possible first weeks, I think, that they were in session, but we still, uh, most of the town budgets were finished by then. So not a lot of them have put in yet. So we've got a, still got an opportunity here. Uh, an underserved location means that a location that only has access to a reliable wireline broadband connection capable of speeds of less than four megabits per second download and one megabits upload. It's called service 4-1. And an underserved location means a location that has access to a wireline broadband connection capable of speeds of at least Four megabits per second download. No, oh, I got that backwards. So 25 megabytes download and four megabytes upload. So that's underserved. Uh, that's underserved is 25 free. And uh, the and other one that was four one, four one is unserved. 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 Yeah. And underserved means you got something. But it's not, it's like a dialogue. Well, underserved sounds like, I mean, uh, unserved sounds like dialogue. And unserved is basically, you know, basically got nothing. Well, it says four, four one. one. It's like, well, that's probably that. These days, it's just about dead. Okay. <laughs> you know, maybe. Yeah. Who wants that? What's, um, uh, I think it was in here, but I can't remember what page or not. What um do we have the numbers or estimated numbers for unserved and underserved households? I know it's somewhere. I just yes, we do. Did I bring that? I hope they brought that. I will see it on the sheet. Oh, okay. uh, the one that stuck out to me was eighty six single family. Lines, right, right. I can oh, that, that's so that's on that same page. Which yeah. is okay. Like commercial and campsite, so I followed yeah, yeah. Linda sent us. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. It's yeah, okay. All right. So document. anyway, I'll, I'll finish my presentation because we're getting to the good stuff here. Um, the uh, the voters all signed something that said, we, the undersigned residents of Waterbury, request the select board to commit 5% of the commu community's ARPA funds to CD Fiber to be matched dollar for dollar by the state for broadband construction in Waterbury. So I had a, a, quite a lot of interest. I don't have anyone that said, no, I don't want to sign. According to the ARPA South Vermont Creative Network publication on January 5th this year, on page 11, the final treasury rules state, according to the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, that, and this is the quote, the legislative body of a municipality is the ultimate arbiter of how ARPA funds will be spent. There is no higher authority or approval process. 
So basically the select board has the authority to authorize the use of ARPA funds. No voter approval is actually needed. This is different from town funds that you folks put up onto the March town meeting. This is federal ARPA funds. So, the so we would be basically if we give a thumbs up, we're saying you could use yep. federal ARPA money, ARPA money, not town town money. Okay. So you, I cannot, you can't use town money. Right. Only ARPA funds Just, or federal grants or state minutes. grants, and that's what right. we're asking for. Okay. Just making sure. Yeah. And I uh, sent an email the other day, uh, suspecting that that it needed voter approval, uh, but I have since confirmed, okay. Linda sent me the information that she just read. I spoke with Katie Buckley from DLCT this afternoon, who I, I had written, I had emailed Katie earlier last week to say, we've got this request, we're already through the process and through town meeting, and you know we've appropriated some of our money, can we do this? I thought that we could, but I wanted to hedge that we couldn't. Uh, Linda is absolutely correct. The, the rule does state that the legislative body is the final authority. Uh, towns can do whatever they want. So we chose for the seven or eight hundred thousand dollars that we appropriated to do it through the budget process. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. So the select board basically recommended to the voters, and the voters approved the hundred thousand dollars to the ice center and the six hundred thousand dollars to EFA. It does not have to go to the voters. I speculated with Linda the other day that if it did, the select board could call a special town meeting. You said that at the last meeting, right. like uh, it's not necessary to do that. So it is within your uh, discretion to use the money. Um, but you know it is a finite resource, and while the select board has the final authority, there's also been lots of uh, statements from the U.S. Treasury, from the legislature, from the League of Cities and Towns that you should have a public process. And I think we have chosen the most transparent public process so far. In that we had a number of meetings where we talked about the budget. So I will approve the budget, sent it to the voters. So you can do this uh, tonight. I, I don't suspect, given that you have until September. And while I agree with Linda that it would be not a good idea to wait until September, <clears throat> if not a lot of other towns have made this appropriation, you, you have a little time. You don't have to necessarily decide it tonight. I did have one question, and I think you answered it. And it was the question that I asked you Can you explain to me, in order to serve the underserved and the unserved population, which ranges from 86 single family homes to what was it, 220 that included campsites and everything else like that? What was that? 209 total unserved and underserved in Waterbury. Right. And 86 of those. 209. Okay. 86, 86 of those are single family dwellings, they're called, which could be a mobile home right. or a house. Right. Um, then there's a, 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 a pile of other, and the, and the list is on the, the back of the chair's okay. letter. Um, so, like, my, my question was yeah. in order to serve those 86. Single family homes and up to 209 underserved and unserved members of the population. CV Fiber is proposing or suggesting that uh, a network of 75 miles of fiber needs to be built. 72, order, think, but well, 72 yeah. miles of yeah. fiber needs to be built. And it seems that you just said. You want to see the fibers proposing to do that to give everybody in Waterbury the opportunity to mm -hmm. have some competition. In a lot of places, there is competition mm -hmm. right now. You can yeah. have Fairpoint and have, well, it's not Fairpoint, it's consolidated. Yeah. So you can have consolidated, you can have 
uh, we can have Comcast and there may be maybe others. Um, and initially when CD Fiber came to the board last October and talked about the priority was hopefully maybe by the end of 2022 to, to serve, to get service to these uh, underserved populations. I was figuring that what would happen was Ring Road, for example, you know, I live on Ripley Road, Comcast and Consolidated go right by Ring Road, that the idea would be string a cable up Ring Road from Ripley Road, uh, whether it's Fiber, uh, Comcast, or Fairpoint, but get the, the infrastructure up Ring Road and then let people up there who might have long driveways or not do what they did with the electric company. But it seems that you're suggesting in order to serve these 200 properties that we have to spend $3 million and wire the, we wire the whole path. And so, we, we cannot use what Comcast has. Fiber optic. They have some cabling all over town, right? We can't use theirs. Well, no, you can't use theirs if the idea is that CD fiber is going to become the purveyor of, of internet. Uh, ARPA money could be appropriated or funding through CD fiber. I mean, but you, I guess what you're saying is that CD fiber wants to operate an internet business as well as serve the underserved. Um, municipality business. They want so, to be we, so back, we, we, right. I just, want, I, just, I just want everybody to know that it was before the flood because it was, we were still in 51 South Main Street. Uh, Burlington Telecom came here then and made a pitch to the select board and said, you know, we're going to make a municipal telecom in, in Burlington and we can run it right down the interstate and you know, you don't have to have Comcast anymore. And you know, the cost was pretty high and there was a lot of talk about grant money and everything else. But um, I just wanted to make sure that we understood that I'm not making a judgment that this is a good or a bad thing. But what CV Fiber is really talking about is spending $3 million to make a duplication of infrastructure that's already out there to compete against the private businesses that are already providing this service in order to get it to But the private 200. businesses won't do everyone. It's not, they look at it as unsustainable. And by the way, I've been looking at this too, going to all our financial meetings. I'm not arguing with you. I, I agree with you. It's not, they didn't put it up Ripley Road because it, yes. it's not a business. It's not a business. It doesn't thing. make good business yeah. sense yeah. for them to do it. That's right. But we if we do school lunches, how, how much, how much would it cost if it's $3 million to string 72 miles of fiber all over the town, how much would it cost to run fiber up Ring Road? And if the town just It's said, already up there, by the way. Comcast has Ring Road fiber going up that road. Well, then Mark Pryor. Then why, why are the people on Ring Road? Mark says he has literally zero. It's, he struggles to have internet. Um, is it because they don't want to pay? I went to Mark's house. Yeah, and he lives two miles or he lives. And I had a discussion while I was canvassing all the houses up on Ring Road in a month. Mm -hmm. so, so he doesn't want to pay the cost to get it from the telephone pole up to his house? Most of the people up there have style Is that similar? Yeah. And but that's not a part of the definition I wrote. So, it's not considered that they have what the definition is of a, they're considered underserved up there. I understand. I get it. So when we make, hey, a, make when you guys make a decision, 
Hey, Bill, can I just chime in for a second? We're here on Sweet Road. And back, you know, when I moved in in the 90s, it was, I think, Adel- no, it wasn't Adelphia. I forget exactly who it was before uh, Fairpoint, if you recall. I don't. Um, but they wanted 35000 to run it from the cable drop um, out to where we're at here. Uh, so I think for Ring Road, there's somewhere about that same number. Um, I guess the question I have is like, are we actually all subsidizing that as a community now? And then why didn't we do it back then? So that, that was it. I just wanted to share those stats. We're not subsidizing it now. I mean, all the, you know, the, the New England telephones of the world, and then they became Fairpoint, and now they're consolidated. And Adelphia Cable, which became Comcast, uh, they, they, to Linda's point, they, they strung their cable and their infrastructure to places where they believed they could make a profit. So whatever, if they, I don't know what their, what their number was, but if they had, you know, 20 houses per mile, they would think that that was profitable to do that. But if they had less than 20 houses per mile, they wouldn't do that. And I'm sure the number is different than that, but they made business decisions. The town did not subsidize any of that. Um, no, I'm sorry. Let me step back, Bill. I'm not suggesting that the town back then did or didn't. What I'm saying is back then, that was the cost that those private entities said that I would have to cover to bring that cable drop out here, right? So fundamentally, what I'm saying is for us to all pay to bring the cable drop further up Ring Road, I think is the question here, right? Because I think if we look at it and say, well, how do we overlay the lack of service with maybe, you know, an economic um, statistic as well, or sorting filter, that's maybe not 200 homes or whatever that number was, that might be less. And I think if we're looking at optimizing the funds that we publicly put towards this, we have to identify those properties and not necessarily be thinking about extremities. Like I'm not asking for service out here. You know, we actually have Starlink. I think uh, I could be wrong, but I thought Mark had that as well. And it works beautifully. We have great service. So I just, there are options that we don't have to hit all the hinterlands of this community with full fiber. Uh, Is it nice? Sure. Can I get it now? Yeah. Back in the nineties, I couldn't. And, you know, I just have first see roads focused on it instead of like wiring. All I'm, all I'm trying to, the question that I'm trying to ask, and I just did the, the math here, is that in order to serve these underserved populations, the non-served and the underserved populations, 200 properties in town, CV Fiber is proposing $2.95 million for 72 miles of cable to do that. So if you do the math, you take three point, I mean 2.95 million and you divide it by 72 miles, it costs about $41,000 a mile to string cables. And that so yeah. why wouldn't we simply take some ARPA money or why wouldn't CV Fiber try to string a few miles of cable in the town where there isn't any now, and then say, let, let Fairpoint or Comcast bid on who's going to provide the service there. Why do we have- Oh, I see your point. Yeah, all right. Why does CD Fiber have to be the one in the business is my question. Yeah, I was going to say, what well, yeah. if, if, you, if you, you know the shortcomings with- You know the ago. shortcomings with- Comcast and consolidated. I can't imagine creating another uh, internet provider is going to be any more. Uh, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for? You know, uh, better, higher quality provider than than the two that are currently there because so much of it relies on quality staff, right? And Everybody knows that there's a huge shortage of good quality people out there now to do any of these things. Um, to your point, I, you're right. I'm not understanding why we're not. So I, I had a lot of questions that I wanted to ask. 
So of this $50 million project, Waterbury's portion of the 72 miles is $3 million plus or minus. Uh, so what we're saying is to reconstruct an entire uh, new system that another provider is gonna take and provide uh, and be a, another competitor in this market when our goal is to truly provide internet for these outlying homes, why aren't we going to one of these other providers that are already in place, which you're suggesting, and say, what is it gonna to cost to get from where you are now up to the top of the ring road, right? Uh, and provide, because you're right, I deal with it in the developments that I have done where Comcast or the provider won't go in unless there's a certain number of residents to offset their cost and provide them with profit. Uh, so that's why the residents like up in Shaw Mansion, they had to dig up, I forget how many thousands of dollars it was to get them to provide internet up there um, because the numbers weren't there for the company to do it. So they had this, so the people that the residents had to subsidize part of that to get them up there. And we should be doing the same with our ARPA money as opposed to building out a whole new system. But so I mean, we did it would that. cost more. I mean, we, if we were going to use ARPA money, you know, I don't know how many miles, but I mean, Linda's here asking for $75,000 that will be leveraged to get another $75,000. And nobody's suggesting that they're going to come back to the town. Maybe they will. I'm just, so it, it might cost, if Wadbury were to do it alone, it probably would cost more than the $75,000 they're asking for because there's probably more than two or three miles of cable that has to be strong. But all I'm trying to see from the big picture is why isn't somebody who has deeper pockets than water? If there's all this money around that can be used, why not go to Comcast and Fairpoint and let them bid on it? Say, we'll string the cable, yeah. we'll string the cable, and you you <laughs> bid on who's going to provide the service up there. And that's people just, with big pockets like the state of Vermont are doing that and leave the Northeast Kingdom. So just to say, like this communications union district, and to be clear, I have no, I have a lot of questions of why we want to improve on So I'm not trying to say like this, but I think in the Northeast Kingdom, they were one of the first ones to have a fiber district because everyone's super underserved in the and tech. And the model ended up being, in some cases, the best option for the state was to take something that met some federal definition of an underserved block and bid it out to Comcast. And that's what's going to be constructed first, even though the NEK Fiber Network is building their own network. So just to say there are cases where people are doing exactly that, and Waterbury is not one of them, and that's not why. But just to say that model exists in the state of Vermont, and people are doing it in the NEK. Again, if it's the right fit, hammer, size, who's willing to do the work, I think is about discussion but that bidding out this service area we need to serve everyone here because we think insert town of a thousand in the northeast kingdom needs adequate internet service that Comcast or whatever bids on is happening in the state of Vermont. Right. And if we why do is, it why did this get decision was made was three years ago when I wasn't there. So exactly why they don't they have decided to go in this route, I don't know. No I, I and I'm, this is I, it's not a personal no, no, I, no, it's no, just, just it's just trying to ask questions and we were late coming to the party because Waterbury compared to a lot of communities in this area even, is very well served there's places you know if you go to Elmore and places like that there's a much higher po uh, percentage of people that are unserved or underserved than in Waterbury so Waterbury didn't when CD Fiber first kind of came into existence, we didn't even search out to, to join. It was, there were a few people kind of last year that said, and some of the first folks that came here from CD Fiber was like, well, we've been working in other communities and you know, you might be kind of the tail wagging the dog. You might be kind of blast. So I'm not, I'm not trying to diss this or say that it's, not something that we should do. I just have some questions about, boy, why are we building something to duplicate what we already have? And if it's if it's to get one more competitor, is for the people, for those of us who are served, 
Is it likely the price is going to be significantly less if Waitsfield Telecom is operating this for CD, CD fiber than if you know Comcast and Fairpoint can already do? So it's it's just to me it was this weekend was a little bit of an eye opener that I think we're being asked to help duplicate something that's already in existence to get a few people more. So yeah, I think no, I think you're gonna get a lot more if we can keep our subscriber rates lower than Comcast. But I think Bill asked a very valid question is why duplicate even you go to some of these underserved. You build the trunk up there, and why doesn't CV just lease from Comcast part of their line to so you know you could get there instead of creating this whole seventy-two mile network? You may be able to do it with you know five ten miles. You know to get you know I'm my personal opinion. And I'm labeling as such, and I as a select person, but I think I have a lot of people. I don't really have the wherewithal. To support a lot of people who are in some expensive homes so they can get get cheaper service than they do now i'm i'm very concerned when we have a poor person who their kid has to go somewhere to do their lessons which comes to the equity issue exactly and i have brought information on the equity issue and i think they sent it to you right yeah i asked her i'm happy to read to the group because again for town meeting law i sent linda questions and she responded them. Um, my questions were, um, does the 70 miles serve all households in Waterbury? Yes. Some logistics on the grant, um, timing for service, construction end of 24. Again, I don't agree, but the biggest question I said to Linda is, in one sense, there's this very compelling sentence here in grant that says, the select board can specify how the funds should be used. You know, I guess I would say, so big picture, this is my personal view, so now you're all hearing it. Um, internet is an important utility, and I'm not saying that there isn't folks who chose to live in a place that was going to be wildly hard to serve and didn't know that going in. So it, is that necessarily you know, our problem? But I think if there's folks who are trying to get internet and there's a $30,000 per house barrier for something that wasn't really something that they understood and there's an opportunity to leverage it, I agree. I mean, I think, Bill, you brought up a great point. It might not be the most efficient system to do it. I don't necessarily see a world where we as a municipality are taking on this work otherwise. I just don't see us having the expertise in the staff. And so that's why I'm not saying it's the best model. It's the model that's in front of us. No, I get and that. I and so, that. so that's so that's why I think it's an interesting to explore. Then my follow up to Lisa around as a select board member information I would want to have is I thought this number of connecting households was really interesting. Camps and campgrounds, I don't know that necessarily like that isn't the top of mind, but single family dwellings, very interesting. So and then it becomes a question of. So should, in a hypothetical scenario, if we supported funding, should it be for general construction of the network? Should it be this, you chose to have a five mile driveway and now we're gonna <laughs> allocate $30,000. So that was the equity piece. I said to Lisa around, you know, like, in one sense, it's very nice that you offer that if the select board was to have funding, you could decide what to do with it. But I don't feel like I have the expertise or wherewithal to figure out how to distribute that fairly. But I think us as a board, we need to have a question about like, what do we think our role might be? I mean, like, you know, what you're saying, like, who needs the fiber? And is it a thing, game we want to get involved in? And again, I'm not saying I think CV fiber is the most efficient, but I would say, one, you know, thank you for your service in that, like, it, you know, again, it might not be the most efficient, but I just don't see a way that we're serving it otherwise. So that's the piece that keeps me intrigued. Um, I do think we have some more time to have more nuance. My other, one of my other big concerns is, Paying for redundancy in in internet infrastructure that's already there and taking away from our ARPA money that we could be using for other needs in the town, you know what I'm saying? And, we'll and, and draining like, that, like, draining like, that because if you're, like you're getting 1.5 in ARPA money, but it takes two years, right? Isn't that what you're getting? Yeah, I'm asking for 75. No, you, this you year, Linda, you're, you're asking for 75 time. this year. And, and if there's other grants that come through that we have to match, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I don't know what that is. You don't have to match them, no. but it's a good idea if you want I understand to. that. And, and, it's better than using and, I, money and I'm not, you yeah. know, I'm not denying that we shouldn't match those monies, but I'm saying, you know, is this a, I thought I read that this is a four-year build out or is it a five-year build out? 
you recall. Everything's used to be going slower, okay. again, especially to the fact that the final so, optic cable hasn't five. showed up yet. It, so, so, okay, to so. that point as well, so yeah. if it's a four or five year build out, I think it's, I think it's, see, it's you're, you're slated for 24 or 25. So, if every year, uh, and this ARPA money has to be has to be appropriated by 2024 and has to be spent by 2026. Okay, so we've got we've got four years. So between so the timeline for this and the yeah, timeline two years to appropriate it. Yeah, yeah. Two and a half two years years to it. yeah. So I'm just I'm curious as to how much because obviously the 75,000 isn't going to be the end of the line for this. It, you may end up coming back to us again next year for more. Uh, to finish it up because also we're, we're facing with inflation issues, uh, you know, supply chain shortage issues, all kinds of different issues that are probably going to drive this cost even higher. Uh, so there's, to everybody's point here, there's a lot of the questions that need to be looked well, into and answered. One way you can solve that, I mean, Linda has explained very eloquently that even if you wanted to, you cannot, by law, use town um, tax dollars to pay for this. So if you appropriated $75,000 of ARPA money to CV Fiber now or at your next meeting or in June, whenever you do it, and then you decided how to use the rest of your ARPA money, if there's no more ARPA money to be to be spent, then you can't, there's no other money that you can get from you because you can't use town tax money. So, you know, I, I think, you know, if you wanted to use it, you could be judicious and say, you know, given all the work that they've done, this might be an investment that we're willing to make. They can leverage money for this. We'll have input about how it can be used and express these concerns, but I think that there's probably a reasonable way that you could just say this this is all there is, you know, and, and the rest of your offer money you to use for other things. I'm not sure that well, I'm just not sure. I don't think a resolution is gonna happen tonight. And seeing that it's 10 15, I wonder if there's anything that's really important to say now. And then if we can talk about putting it on the future agenda, whether it's next meeting or the one after. And then maybe we can all work to, we all have, really have a lot of questions. And if we have come, you know, prepared with those or even send them to Linda ahead of time. I mean, I know mm -hmm. Linda's concern is the timeline for the grant. You know, sure. 100% get that. I was that. really worried about the fact that if we had to do a special meeting, that that was going to really right. move us right. pretty far out, you know, mid-summer before some kind of decision was made and that's when it's going to start getting dicey because mm -hmm. the other towns in it are going to be putting in their stuff because they already know their select boards can make the decision but linda i don't even think there's among the five of us a real strong consensus of one way or the other right now yeah no and, and i don't I'm we're not gonna i don't think business. yeah i don't want to put this off for three months but i it's right. not going to be tonight so i'm happy to Ask that it's next meeting. I don't know what the agenda might look like, but that's I'm unavailable next next meeting. Sure, but I will be glad to answer any questions that you sent to me. I will be out of state for the next okay. meeting, which is mm -hmm. another reason I was wanted to get on this right. one. Totally understand. Um, there's and, one and maybe all, like all the board members can, if with questions, e email you and you can answer their questions. And there's one more point I would like to make. Sure. Um, and I didn't read how to the process to go through the process yet, but from an equity issue, um, there are going, there are some uh, homeowners in town who could never afford to connect themselves and could never afford uh, seventy five dollars a month subscription rate. Um, so they will they will never get anything more than uh, dive. And they, if they have kids in school or they are trying to work remotely, these people are at a big disadvantage. Okay. Um, how do we, we look at these 86 uh, addresses, and how do we decide 
Which ones are just wealthy people that have moved in, like up on Ring Road, and don't even worry about our homes? And they can afford, as one, one of them told me, to put the $4,000 in to have Comcast connect to his house, as opposed to the others who will never be able to afford anything more than $4,000. There's an equity issue here. I would love to see you provide data on that bus. Great. Um, because what I came with is um, I'm on the policy committee. <laughs> I'm the vice chair of the policy committee. Okay. And there is a equal access to broadband EAB that is being uh, going through a feasibility study um, in EC fiber. And um, we went to a presentation on that. There's a woman running it. Her name is Holly Groshner, and it's it's on broadband availability and affordability. And they're trying to put together basically a program where the people who want to get subsidized basically uh, can uh, apply to get lower rates and to get help to get committed to get connected. Which means out of this 86 single family home, there probably isn't a lot of people from what I saw on Green Road that would qualify for this social program. Okay. So in Waterbury, we have a pile of 112 camps and campgrounds. We have 86 single family dwellings, which are not all going to qualify for a subsidy, right? And we have two commercial industrial places. We have four state parks, community recreations. They're probably not going to qualify. Those would have to be on this list for the town to, to connect if, you, if they wanted any high speed. Three utilities, one government, one National Guard armory for a total of 209. So you as a select board can make decisions about where you want this money to go, which ones of these households, addresses, do you want to connect the camps? Do you, you know, do you want to connect camp rounds? I would say no. <laughs> I know it's nice to have at your campground to have internet, but I don't think it's well, really, really yeah, essential. Yeah. Like if you want it, I mean, camping is for that purpose to get away. From exactly. Yeah. If you wanted to bring it to one. Other deliverable that might be helpful for us is I understand I think CD Fiber has a like, I would buy CD Fiber if you put it in front of my house. I don't know if that information is confidential. Oh, but they're doing surveys. Is that what yeah. you'd like? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I could, to me, it would be useful to, I have heard a handful of comments from folks broadly saying that they supported this and you shared the petition signatures, which I appreciate. I think in thinking about if this would be an important priority, hearing from folks saying, I'm not served and I've tried everything in creation to get served. To me, would be a compelling argument in support of some manner of municipal intervention. You put me on the front of the agenda. All the <laughs> people that were here to say that have left. Yeah, you got well, I, I would like to hear. I, I want help people to do I, that. I would like to hear of your 86 homeowners that really need internet. How? What's the income profile? You know, give, but give we can't ask, ask that. Yeah, that's we right. can't mm -hmm. ask that legally. Yeah, we can ask if you are interested and you have low income, would you like to apply? So it seems as though there are a couple of different issues here, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, one is that uh, if this CD fiber network happens to come into existence, then we may have a lower cost option. Uh, for a fiber yeah. connection throughout yeah, the town. Have enough right. Well, and that would require building up the uh, the uh, network, right? Right. Um, so, I, and I guess I would agree with Danny. We we don't have enough information yeah. to make any real decisions here. So why don't we just agree to submit our questions, and then uh, Linda and her team can try to get us the answers that we're looking for, and then we have a more informed discussion. Going Linda, forward. the folks who are here, I assume the people that you're in touch with, could um, if if they're willing to send us an email since they didn't get an opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I don't know if that's asking a lot, but it would be it would definitely be helpful. I don't have their email. No, no, okay, because that's not 
Legally, I can't ask for that. No, I mean, the folks who were here physically tonight that were going to speak. I didn't know if you were people you were in contact with. That's fine. Okay. Basically, I put out a call. Right. Um, unfortunately, and just show, that. show up yeah. here if you would like to say something to the board. Understood. Thanks. Uh, so. Put this back on the agenda in a month. Uh, yeah. Since Linda can't be here. Mm -hmm. next Thank year. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Yeah. Thank you. And in the earlier in the questions. agenda. Um, I didn't expect you guys to make a decision tonight. Sure. Seriously, yeah. seriously. Okay. I did not. Um, this is it's it's not a lot of money to tell you just what I'm asking for, considering that you spent we gave a hundred thousand dollars to the ice rink, you know. So I mean, this is gonna. Um, I don't look at what seventy five thousand. I'm more concerned with a couple like I think Chris. This seventy five is going to become another seventy five, and who knows what. I'm just concerned about. I, I just can't see necessarily recreating the wheel on a whole nother system where CV fiber may put fiber where it's needed and then I they, have pay, they, 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 they pay a dollar fee on gas where it owns the line for the service. Because I know there's been a lot of discussion about how to do this over the course of three years, mm -hmm. uh, but I was not privy to the, the discussion. So if it makes you guys feel more comfortable that you think there would be another option that we could have, it's kind of late in the game to the actual right. swap. Um, they've already spent all oh, um, everything, getting the design up and running and yeah. ordering the fiber yeah. cable and everything. So I don't know how useful this, and it, 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 it just to make you feel better, I can have somebody come and talk to you about it, but I don't see them at changing course at this time. Okay. And I don't see them asking for $3 million from Waterbury. I don't see them asking for that. They will go to a bond get, you know, mm -hmm. and, and to, to cover whatever cost doesn't come down in more grants. I do expect that the government will provide more grants. Well, the government is all of us that we are ultimately <laughs> paid for. I don't look at just where it's grant, 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 but you know, if it's a grant, Someone's paying for it, and it's all the taxpayers. Well, this on Main Street is really nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the big problem with me, and I've seen it time and time again in my industry, is that here's your suggested price to do this, but by the time the project's done, it's right. Oh, it's oh boy, yes. So we we beat this to death. One more. Okay. Uh, I hurry, one more thing. We did ask this question. Um, we did ask the question. How, how do I apply? No, I, I'm just gonna, and I, I mean, this is nice meeting, so I will defer to it. I don't think it's gonna change anything tonight. Yeah, and I think we would be happy to follow up. No, my I'm next agenda item that. is Send about agenda that. planning for future meetings, so I think you'll be more well served by us discussing how to discuss an agenda okay. for the next meeting. But thank you. And, and thanks and for and all this was just to accommodate you. I know you're right at the end, but. At the last moment, it was hard to get you any, anywhere else. On the I, I would really appreciate getting it because um, I could probably answer questions and stuff in the meantime, but I will not go by again. People, you know, you make another decision. I think we'll take our chances. Yeah. So mm -hmm. thank you for coming in. Thank, thank you for yeah. listening. Thank you for putting me on the agenda tonight. I really Thanks. appreciate it. It was worth the trip. <laughs> <laughs> You have patience. That's true. Yeah, What's the last topic? Agenda. Uh, agenda. Well, I just want so we passed our policy. This is right. my annoying added item. Um, that said that those who wish to be added should contact manager, select board chair, town clerk. I didn't know if you all just had a practice in terms of like email, like CC bill. Like, is there just in terms of like coordinating? But obviously, this was the first meeting, and we didn't have a chair, so I knew nothing about what to do. But moving forward, what have you all done that to support? So Carla. could you just ask if you yeah. had an issue, how do you get it on the agenda? Yeah, yeah. Just what's the best prop if like I as yeah. board even want to discuss something? Bill and Who I, should I email for all of you? Bill, Bill, Bill and I put the agendas right. together. Okay. Great. Great. Um, and then the two specific things that the Dens didn't know how to discuss because we can't talk between meetings, but was just that I did want to raise it if at the future meeting we want to do some. I know at past first like what meetings though you mentioned like planning for the year. I mean, judging from tonight's agenda, we have a really full slate. So I'm not trying to propose that we would take on a bunch of other projects, but just to have some time for a general conversation and then the self-interested but not pieces that as you probably know I was on the planning commission. Steve was nice enough to call the municipal attorney who said I can do that until they appoint someone else, but I think you all reported it. Right. It probably is good to get someone sooner 
at, I went to the meeting one day and planning commission members feel strongly about let's get some women as soon as possible. We talked about um, someone can certainly come to meetings if they're interested, whether they're a member or not. Um, so that's one piece of it, just that timeline for boards and committees. And then also as someone who's so excited about more meetings about planning, I would, you know, in all seriousness, be, still be interested in liaising with the planning commission as that made sense. And so I think that's also a more general, just select board conversation about how we connect with our boards and committees. So I just wanted to throw those out there as things I'm thinking about us discussing and I want to just put them on the agenda other than to raise the planning commission issue just because it seems I think we could have that but I think let's maybe let's talk you know and then we can raise it as an agenda item. Perfect. Like I said I just didn't know the protocol to do that. So. You can also I've emailed Carla and asked how full the agenda is depending on how high of a priority the item is and she'll say there's only one other thing or it's too full so we usually you have on the thing a parking lot right. we have some things that we can't get to and eventually we've been pretty good about getting to a lot of those items but sometimes they're either bigger items and you have to kind of push it off a little bit so i think one of the underlining concerns is you know because of partially because of this meeting tonight is you know what if, what are select board members expectations of where this ARPA money might end up the next couple of years. I think that's a huge part of you know, our future planning because mm -hmm. it gives us the availability to perhaps catch up on some things that we've been behind on. Or really you can't, it's nice to have uh, broadband to everybody's house, but if you can't get to the, if you can't get back home and use it, there's a, there's a problem there, you know? <laughs> You're driving through, one thing? through uh, actually need money. Yeah, the, uh, the appointments of delegates and alternates to CB Fiber happened in April. Oh. When, when in April? After. Can we do it at the April, our April 4th meeting? We yes. usually do appointments at the April 18th meeting because their terms go through April 3rd. Okay, there. Okay. Did okay. you reappoint me? I'd love to stay. <laughs> You'll be here that meeting too. I'll be at that meeting too. Yeah. Okay. And Christopher said the same thing. So. Okay. That sounds good. You both have done a great job. Yeah. Thank you. Consistency. Okay. Is key. They were consistency is key. Yes. Last year. Um, could I could I entertain a motion to adjourn? Also, so early. So know, early. What are we going to do for the rest of the night? <laughs> I thought we were so close, but until we got to the CB5, where we make it, if it was like 15 right. to 20 minutes. Oh, but then, was I will second, second that. Let's second do it. Second then. All in favor, say aye. 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 aye.